Uh, it being 930, uh, as uh, chair of Division Three of the House Finance Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I'm confirming that we're providing access to this meeting to the public by telephone and also uh, through uh, the, the Zoom link. The committee is using a Zoom video webinar for our remote meeting. All members of the committee and the staff of state agencies with agenda items have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during the meeting through the platform. The public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on Zoom or phone following the directions and links provided in the House calendar starting at uh, House calendar 8 and running all the way through. I think the current version is House calendar 16. Those are all hanging on the um, uh, Gen Court public website. Uh, we have, uh, I can assure you, we provided public notice of the necessary information by accessing the meeting. We previously gave notice to the public of the necessary information for accessing the meeting telephonically. Those instructions are also in the House calendar. Now, we are providing a mechanism to the public to alert us if there are problems with access. And you do that by emailing LBA underscore F-I-S-C-A-L at leg.state.nh.us. Um, and that if we find out that the public is having trouble accessing the meeting, uh, we will adjourn and reschedule. Uh, please note that all votes that we take during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. And uh, I don't anticipate uh, doing any roll call votes, at least until um, all seven of the committee are present. So uh, Representative Bean, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance and then each member as they state their presence or uh, announces their presence. Please also let us know if there's anyone in the room during the meeting so that we can comply with, comply with the right to know law. Representative Bean, will you take attendance please? Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Walner. Representative Walner is here. I'm in Concord <clears throat> in my home, and my husband is not in the house. Representative Nordgren. Representative Nordgren here in Hanover in my dining room slash office. Representative Rogers. Catherine Rogers. I'm in Concord in my apartment with my dog, Romeo. Representative Burrup. Uh, present, home alone in my home office. Representative Edwards. I'm in uh, my home office in Auburn. I have family in the house, but uh, my door is shut. I don't expect them to come in. I'm Representative Bean. I'm at home in Guilford in my house. My wife is here. She's in the other room. Uh, Representative Weiler. Representative Weiler, I think, is uh, is late. All, all others are present and accounted for. Right. Representative Weiler, I'm sure, is attending the uh, Joint Legislative Fiscal Committee or, or one of the related committees associated with it. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to go over today's agenda. I emailed it to the committee members, an image of it, probably 40 minutes or so ago. Uh, but for the members of the public, uh, we have a very, very full day. And we've got some guests coming in at scheduled time. So, so we may have to take some uh, recesses and, and take some diversions around things. But um, this is, uh, as far as the plan goes, this is the last major day where the Division Three is gathering information and uh, discussing uh, some of these things before uh, some big votes on HB1 and HB2 uh, next week. So, um, so we have a tight agenda. We're gonna start by talking about HB2, section 34. Uh, then we have um, uh, Mr. Wetters and um, I think 
uh, Goulet, Dennis Goulet, the commissioner of DOIT is going to join him uh, at around 1030. And we'll discuss uh, HB2 some more, sections 35, 37, 41, 24, and 25. Somewhere in here, we're, we're gonna uh, break for lunch. And when we come back from lunch, uh, we'll, uh, we'll ask the LBA to update us on the status of all the HB2 work to include the work we've done through the morning and to include um, some, some new draft HB2 so that people have situational awareness on what we're doing. Um, we're going to uh, make sure that Ms. Rounds, before she leaves at 2 p.m., has an opportunity to talk to us about six or seven footnotes that are in HB1. Uh, we have an update on uh, the department's uh, uh, considering to work with us on using enhanced FMAP for a couple of other areas of the uh, Medicaid budget. Representative Walner, I, I think uh, you're expecting that we're, we can come back and talk to you one last time on a, on a vote for the uh, TANF Child Care Flex. Is that right? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Throughout the day, we're gonna be talking about H, HB1 and uh, some with proposals and votes and and uh, last but not least, and it's so important, we'll probably break in when we have a ways and means up update. I, I want to wait for Representative Weiler as a minimum before we do that. But uh, I am cautiously optimistic that we have good news breaking. Um, so stay tuned. Okay, with that, uh, Mr. Ripple. Would yes. you up HB2 and share it and take us to section 34? And what I'm going to do is uh, because this is a, a topic that I assume there's a lot of public interest in, I want to I want to set us up for this discussion just a, a little bit differently than we normally do. Um, but I, I want to uh, provide transparency and an opportunity for people to comment. Okay, so section 34 is what we're going to talk about. Uh, as proposed, uh, as introduced, it's there on lines four, five, six, seven, and eight. As I understand these five lines, these were in last year's HB2 identical to this. Can you confirm that, Mr. Ripple? Is that, it? that is identical language to last, last year's or last term's um, HB2 item, isn't it? It's close, but not quite exact. There was some additional language in the beginning that said, except for funds appropriated in the operating budget, comma, no, st no state funds awarded. Um, other than that, the language is identical. Okay, so um, I know that Representative Erica Leon, L-A-Y-O-N, I'm still not sure exactly how to pronounce her name, uh, has, uh, an, wants to introduce an amendment to this section 34. So we, can we call that up? Do you have uh, uh, amendment, what is it? Uh, 0830 Hotel that you can yep. pull up. It's up on the screen now. Pull it to where people can read the entire thing. Okay, through line 20. Okay, so, um, so for the purpose of founding the scope on what we're doing here today, we are considering uh, replacing section 34 with this language. And I want to wait 60 seconds so that everybody can read section 34. Uh, I think this has been posted on the LBA website, which is uh, which has made it publicly available, but I, I, I wanna make sure that we're all, everyone who's participating today has got a common set point. And then Representative Bean, you're, you're gonna be my uh, guinea pig. Raise your hand when you, you've had a chance to read the whole thing, please. Yeah. 
and you can you can bring Representative Erica Leon in. Okay. I'm not sure she could hear you, Representative. Oh, uh, Representative Nordgren, your hand is up. Are you able to hear me? She took the hand down. Um, so Representative Bean, you raised your hand. So good, we're through. Okay, um, so uh, Representative Leon, do you want to uh, speak to your uh, amendment? Is she in? Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, you're great. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, honorable members of the House Finance Committee. For the record, I am Representative Erica Leon from Rockingham Six Dairy. I am introducing Amendment 2021-08308 to Section 34 of House Bill 2. Section 34 of House Bill 2 discusses family planning programs and uses the language from previous budgets. It is actually the, in the bill, it's actually the exact same language as the 2017 um, House Bill for the budget. Um, Administrative Rule HEW 509.07 states that the services which shall not be covered as family planning or family planning related services and abortions are called out specifically as a non-covered service. Despite solid work from previous, previous legislative bodies, family planning funds remain more fluid than intended, and recipients are making the most efficient use of those funds that are available, and they're working right up to the extent of the law. This language here is to tighten up the language so that no really means no. A reproductive health care facility is defined in the statutes, and by using this definition combined with the current reg rules and regulations, this, this set, simply sets out into law what is already in the administrative rules and has already been included in previous budgets. This amendment just clarifies the intent of the original section 34. It prevents confusion of funds and it honors the state rules and policies. So I ask that you adopt this amendment. Are you willing to take questions? Um, I'm willing to take a few. <clears throat> I have a hard stop at 10. Okay, is, um, is, uh, I, I think you were gonna invite Mr. Mike, what was his name, Hennessy? Um, let me pull up his. Mike Tierney, I'm so wrong. Mike Tierney, uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Ripple, would please bring in Mr. Tier Tier Tierney as well. Okay, he's coming over now. Good morning. Good, good morning, uh, Mr. Tierney. Uh, thank you for joining us. As I'm, I'm bringing you over with uh, uh, Representative Leon because I understand uh, you worked with her and with a group of uh, legislators, and that and that you're an attorney that helped draft this. So I, I thought I would ask you to introduce yourself and and uh, and ask you if you'd be willing to take questions as they're presented uh, by the committee and maybe the participants. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Would you introduce yourself for the record? Yes, Michael Tierney. Um, I'm here on behalf of Cornerstone. Um, and as you indicated, I have um, had some discussions with uh, Representative Leon about um, this particular amendment and how this particular amendment has been um, upheld in previous court cases, including Russ v. Sullivan. Thank you for that. Uh, and notice that Representative Nordgren and Representative Rogers have their hands up. We'll go in that order. Representative uh, Nordgren. Yes, um, I just wanted to clear up any confusion. Are, are we open for public discussion of other people who were on this Zoom? There will be an opportunity. There will be an I'm trying to answer your question. There will be an opportunity for uh, people who are calling in to, uh, to, 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 to make a short statement. Uh, so, um, so do you have another question? 
Well, I just wanted you maybe to repeat how people do that because I, it was my understanding late last night that there was not gonna be an opportunity for testimony. So I just need to have it clarified for the public. Thank you. I've never said that. So I, I don't know where that came from. Uh, it's always been my intent to uh, make this uh, a publicly accessible and transparent conversation. So I'm sorry that uh, some, somebody interjected some confusion into this. Uh, Representative Rogers. Yes. Uh, yes, I have a question for um, Representative Leon. Um, the state budget, as you said, already prevents any family planning dollars from going towards abortion. Um, and it's been a longstanding part of the, the budget and part of the practice. And we all know that federal dollars cannot go towards that. If this amendment passes, it risks patient access to affordable birth control, um, STD testing and cancer screenings um, and a number of um, people that get their health care, uh, women especially who get their health care in the western part of the state um, would be unable to get any of that health care. This would effectively close down um, a number of clinics that are providing that. As I said, the STD testing is almost exclusively, I believe 97% of the STD testing, in fact, is done by clinics that um, also provide abortion services. So you close them down because it's physically impossible for them to do as you require in this. I know in 2017, in fact, there was a Senate bill that was defeated, which was this exact same language. Um, so it's being recycled now. So. Um, what is your exact intent of this? Is your intent to, in fact, close down these clinics? Um, thank you, Representative Rogers, for your question. I am a financial analyst and an economist, and I see how much how finances can flow from one section to another. My intention is not to shut down these clinics. My intention is for state funds to be used for the intended purpose, which is family planning services. There has been an issue with, uh, with these funds going to pay for overhead and other issues which benefit the, the provision of abortion services, which would otherwise need to be, be paid for by those non-state funds. Right now, there are fund, state funds that are going to support political advocacy and other issues. And this is something where we need to have a clear line and we need to make sure that we are supporting these important family planning services, but there, if there, if there's an issue with some places in the western part of the state, that that's, I guess that's something that can actually probably be better referred to by some of the some of the other experts that are here. The, but this is an issue where I've seen companies that that move these funds around, and we need to make sure that it's clear because our state doesn't allow that funding. And if you're funding everything up and around an abortion, then that is not a clear use of funds. And we're just trying to clear, clear up those definitions and make sure that no means no, and these state funds are appropriately allocated. I could have a follow up, Mr. Representative Edwards. Yes, ma'am. Um, are you aware that the passage of this amendment is going to be defunding um, multiple safety net providers for people, especially low income peoples in around the state, that in fact, according to the department in um, fiscal year 19 or 2020, 97% of the chlamydia and gonorrhea testing in the program was completed by the providers that you'll be closing down. 89% of the pap tests and 67% of breast exams were completed by these same providers. If this amended pass, amendment passes, we're gonna be defunding safety net providers during a pandemic. Um, where would you have these patients go? Um, or do you just not care about the low income care preventative um, care, low income cost care for preventative folks? Um, because you'll be leaving them with absolutely nothing at this point. Um, thank you, Representative Rogers. Are, are you saying that these funds need to be provided to abortion providers so that women can get basic health services? Are you saying I'm, we need to fund that? I'm saying that these are the providers that do this. They also do provide abortions, a very small part of what they provide. But the way your amendment is worded, 
which is the exact same thing that was in the federal um, law that provided was in there for the last few years and which was the same thing as a Senate bill that was defeated in 2017 is in fact going to affect the people that provide same, same health care to low income women in parts of our state. And I gave you the statistics of the amount of health care they provide. So in effect, with what oh, you're thank you, thank you. You do, um, the thing that we have the statistics for and we have evidence that they do will be stopped. What you're claiming they do, but you're providing no evidence question. for. Wait, 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 wait. So, so um, Rep Representative Rogers, uh, let, let's try to treat this like a, a, a typical public hearing. If you have a, a question to ask Representative Leon and then Representative Leon, would you please uh, wait until uh, uh, Representative Rogers completes her question? I'm trying simply to say that I've given her the evidence the department has given us of what these providers do do. She's making claims without any evidence of what she thinks they do. Let's, and, let's, yeah. let's, that's, a, that's too strong, uh, Representative Rogers. You, you don't know what her evidence is. You're, you're asking her for evidence, uh, which is a fair She's question. But you should not assume uh, whether she has evidence or not until you've asked her. Well, do you have evidence of your claims? And if you do, would you provide it to us? And are you aware you'll be shutting down providers that in fact do what the department has told us they do? Uh, thank you, Representative Rogers. Attorney Tierney has some of that evidence. I am not a lawyer. I am an economist and a financial analyst. I know that when I was younger, I chose to receive my services at some of these providers so that I could make sure that my funding was going towards what I believe to be important services. This is a choice that other women with health insurance can choose to do. Uh, this does not necessarily defund them. It just makes this more of a choice issue. Um, I would like to defer to that evidence to, rep to, um, to Mr. Tierney because um, I, I worked more on this language and this clarification of use of funds. Mr. Tierney, are, are you prepared to answer Representative Rogers' question regarding evidence? Yes, thank you. Um, so this uh, amendment does not defund anyone. Um, this amendment just requires that any entity um, that is uh, providing abortions um, and also wishes to receive state funds for other purposes, such as a family planning project, needs to be physically and financially separate from an abortion providing reproductive health facility. The abortion providing reproductive health facility as defined in the statute is just a very limited number of places um, and those places need to be physically and financially separate from an entity um, other location that could provide other services. The five locations that I'm aware of um, that are uh, defined by the statute are all um, within two miles um, of another medical clinic or of a um, hospital um, that does also provide um, a full set of services without providing abortions. Um, so in Manchester and Concord, um, in Keene, there are all um, alternate medical providers um, who are not um, reproductive health um, facilities as defined in the statutes, otherwise known as abortion clinics. Could I Rogers, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Um, you asked for that to be separate, which is, again, something that is nearly impossible for places, but you also in this amendment talk about a state funded process shall not encourage, promote, or advocate as a method that it prohibits them from assisting women obtaining. Um, so basically if any woman asks if they know where they can obtain an abortion, if they inquire, so if they even mention the word, they lose the funding. Um, I think that this is impossible to do if somebody asks you and you just deny them information. Um, that, that can't be done. So it's an impossible amendment. Um, and you know that this is going to cost them any kind of funding that they get. Do right you have now, a question, they're Representative so, Rogers? Yes, I do, if you'd let me finish. No, so I, 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 don't, I don't want this to be a debate. I think this is where we ask questions and get answers. Well, if you let me finish. 
with this language in here, Mr. Tierney, and this is the same language that the Senate bill defeated, aren't you in fact making it impossible for any clinic to adhere to these and keep their funding? Uh, that would be incorrect. Um, as you are well aware, uh, this language is currently in federal regulations, 42 CFR uh, 19, um, and the current um, federal regulations has caused some abortion clinics to choose not to participate in the program, uh, but other clinics have continued to participate in the program. Um, the uh, people whose salaries are paid for by taxpayer dollars um, are not pursuant to this amendment going to be able to advocate for abortion as a uh, method of family planning. And that's something that the uh, state of New Hampshire has the right to do. It has the right to um, decide what speech its um, taxpayer dollars are paying for. And if the um, amendment is adopted, it's making a choice not to force the taxpayers uh, to subsidize um, speech advocating for increased abortion access. So you're willing to forfeit low-income women's health care services for this amendment? Incorrect. Um, low-income women's health care services are going to continue to be provided if abortion clinics decide that they want to continue to have um, the overhead subsidies as a family planning project. They need to make sure that when their rent, their electricity, um, their um, other overhead expenses are being paid for as part of the family planning uh, program, that they have something that is physically separate from where they are performing the abortions so that there's no indirect subsidization of those abortions. I think I heard her question to be something slightly different. I, 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 I think the essence of what she's saying or asking is, um, do we believe that if this amendment goes forward, that there would be a, a gap in access to these services in any part of the state? Or are we confident that there are other providers that would be available to compete and provide full statewide coverage? Thank you. I'm very confident that there are other providers to provide all non-abortion services. Um, the um, abortion clinics are all located in a portion of the state uh, where there are other uh, medical providers, Manchester, Concord, um, Keene. There are all medical providers within two miles of where there is an abortion um, clinic. And an abortion clinic can choose to have a separate, both physically and financially, separate location to provide their non-abortion services. And so it's not that the state uh, would be defunding them if the abortion clinics decide to house all of their services um, together. Um, that is the choice that they would be making. Representative Rogers, do you have a follow-up or another question, ma'am? Um, I could, but I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Right. Are there any other questions from the committee? I, I, I just want to clarify something, Mr. Tierney. Uh, you've used the term abortion clinic uh, a, a few times in your answer, and uh, the, the term in the statute is a reproductive health facility. Uh, are those two terms synonymous? Are they exactly the same thing? So I apologize. Abortion clinic is not a defined term. A reproductive health facility is a defined term, and it's defined um, as a clinic other than a hospital um, that provides um, abortion services. And so a reproductive health care facility as defined in RSA 132.37.1 um, does not include um, any hospitals that may um, you know, also provide abortions in addition to all other um, services a hospital may provide. Okay, thank, thank you for that answer. I'm not seeing hands raised by any of the other committee members. Um, so, uh, Mr. Ripple, let's take a look at the participants. I see two hands raised. Okay, for the members uh, of, who are uh, listening in, uh, I, I would like all of you that would like to speak to raise your hand because we have 
uh, a certain amount of time, uh, Representative Leone, I think you have to leave now, as a matter of fact, but uh, yeah. we need to finish by 1030 because we have other guests. I see uh, four hands raised. <clears throat> I would like uh, to keep remarks to um, three minutes. Uh, and I would ask you to stick within the scope of section 34 as introduced or within the scope of the amendment being proposed. Um, this, this is not intended to be a debating society on, on whether abortions are good or not. Uh, we know abortions uh, are constitutionally medic, uh, a constitutionally protected medical procedure. And, um, and to the extent that it's a constitutionally protected medical procedure, uh, there's really no debate for us to have. It's abortion is an option that some people choose to uh, take advantage of. So Representative Horgan, uh, Horgan I'm, I'm gonna ask Mr. Ripple to, uh, to allow you to speak. Uh, I would encourage you to remember that as a representative, all of us are bound by the um, protocols of decorum and that, and that we just agree to maintain decorum as we have our conversation. You're welcome to speak, sir. Or... Good, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Good, I'm not, I'm doing it on a laptop on a uh, Bluetooth headset. So um, I'll try to keep within decorum, um, which uh, you're a, uh, I know you're a uh, very fierce defender of. And I was not expecting to speak to this. So I just want to say uh, this, uh, it is a constitutionally uh, protected procedure. And um, so some young women who use these facilities need state funding um, will choose to avail themselves of it. Not everybody in that situation. I'm speaking as an old man. So this, uh, so this uh, procedure is not something that I'm uh, physically capable of having or, but um, there are uh, young women have the, uh, same rights to state services as everyone else. And um, also this would, I believe, effectively defund um, many very uh, valuable uh, healthcare facilities, especially, uh, especially, planned, uh, especially Planned Parenthood and the other, uh, and the Equality Health Center here in Concord. So I think this is a, so I think this is a, a bad amendment and also it should not be handled as an amendment. It should, uh, I believe it would have been more appropriate to uh, have this as a standalone bill so we could have a full debate in committee, which probably would have led to the bill being retained and held over the summer. So just sort of sticking this in the budget, I think, um, was not not the wisest thing to do. So uh, I, I urge the uh, committee to uh, go back to the previous section 34, and um, and I think we'd be having a very debate about this if, uh, if men, especially older men, could get pregnant and might need abortion. So that's. Uh, that's about all I have to say. So I urge the committee to uh, omit this from the budget. Thanks. Thank you so much. I, I just want to react to one comment you made about the wisdom of this. Uh, I, right. I don't want to impugn the judgment of Representative Leon, uh, who has introduced this proposed amendment to HB2. Uh, and I would point out okay. that we, we are having a hearing. And so I'll take that as an apology to Representative Leon that you didn't well, mean to lie, that she was not wise. I mean, I apologize, so, but this is a bad amendment, and um, so that's I'm not sure how to much, not sure how much more gently I could phrase it. And I, I, well, I that I, was perfect. That was perfect. I say, Thank you. I, and I Thank certainly you share so your much. concern for. The okay. So uh, we will go. I think um, Ms. Nelson is um, up to speak next. And Ms. Nelson, if you could uh, try to keep your remarks within the contours of the amendment and or section 34, um, this isn't a debate about abortion itself. So um, please, uh, please go ahead and uh, introduce yourself for the record and tell us what you think we need to know, please. Thank you very much. And I appreciate that this is not a debate. I am, my name is Deborah Nelson, and I live in Hanover, New Hampshire, and 
I would agree with the previous speaker's remarks that this really should be handled separately. And my concern is twofold. One is that a gag rule violates medical ethics and standards of care. And when I go to a doctor's office, it's my hope that I will be given full medical advice without concern that there is something being said that I shouldn't hear. I thought it was interesting that Michael Tierney continued to refer to these clinics as abortion clinics. And I appreciate the fact that you corrected him. But he said at one point that the state has the right quote to decide what speech the taxpayer is willing to pay for. And I think that a gag rule is way beyond what the state has the responsibility for putting in place. So I would urge the committee to remove this from the finance. <clears throat> and I would urge the committee to take this out, as I just said, and leave it for fuller discussion elsewhere. I have a lot more <laughs> that I could say about this, but I appreciate the importance of limiting time. So again, I think that this forces providers to violate their duty to provide information that is complete, accurate, and honest to patients. And it is a real mistake. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your uh, testimony. I, I, I won't. I, uh, I won't answer anything you said, uh, but I do uh, appreciate you coming in and talking with us. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, at this point, so I'm still <laughs> going to ask for a little help, Mr. Ripple. Could you could you uh, move from uh, Ms. Nelson to um, Ms. Christine Stoddard, please? Sure. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Christine Stoddard and I work for Bi-State Primary Care Association. And Bi-State represents New Hampshire's 14 community health centers, including Planned Parenthood and the federally qualified health centers that participate in the um, family planning program with DHHS. I agree with the previous speaker, Ms. Nelson, on the medical ethics issue. And I also want to draw your attention to specifically to line 13 of the amendment. Federally qualified health centers are funded in part by the federal government and they're regulated by the Health Services um, and Resources Administration. They have a number of services that they are required by law to provide, including um, primary care, such as family planning services. If they if one of their patients needs a service that they cannot provide, they are required to contract for those services with other providers in their um, area. And they have to have these contracts on file when they are audited and when they are um, inspected by HRSA every three years. They receive financial audits every year. On line 13, I should say 12 and 13, this amendment would prohibit them from entering into contracts with other facilities, including Planned Parenthood. And this is a real life example that one of them gave me. If the, they do not typically stock LARCs, which are long acting reversible contraception, and it's because they can be expensive to stock if they're not used because they expire. So oftentimes they will contract with a reproductive health facility for their patients to access LARCs if necessary. This amendment would prohibit them from doing that and then put them in an awful situation with HRSA and the federal government. That's one issue that I would mention. This amendment would also affect a significant number of low-income people from accessing health services. There's, there's, one, there's one minute left. Okay, thank you. To give you an idea, Amoskeg serves 15,000 patients. Coas County Family Health Services serves 13,000 patients. Lamprey serves 16. Coas is the only family planning provider in that area of the state. Where would their patients go if this amendment passed? They would have nowhere to go to access services. They provide culturally competent services, including translation services. Where would patients go if they needed translation services? There is no replacement for these family planning providers in the state of New Hampshire. 
Thank you. All right, thank you. And I appreciate you staying within the uh, time limit there. Appreciate that. Sure. I know, I know it's a little artificially constrained, but we just need to do it. We know um, you're busy. Thank you. So, so um, I think Representative Leon is gone. If Mr. Tierney is back, is still on, could, yes. could you do and just limit your remarks only to addressing the issue brought up relative to uh, the medical ethics in a, in a gag order? And then also, if you'll remember, uh, address the LARC's access issue, if you can. Sure. So as far as what has been called um, a, a gag order, um, this is current um, federal law. It's current federal law um, as to um, how federal tax dollars are spent. Um, President Biden has announced um, a plan to amend federal law. Um, and so this, um, you know, amendment to the New Hampshire state budget, of course, would only apply to New Hampshire um, tax dollars and where New Hampshire tax dollars are going. Um, an entity that wants to encourage, promote, or advocate abortion does not need to receive um, New Hampshire state tax dollars in order to pay for the salaries of people who are encouraging, promoting, or advocating for abortion. It does not limit um, the right of anybody um, who is not um, receiving uh, New Hampshire state tax dollars as part of a family planning program um, from going forward and encouraging, promoting, and advocating abortion. It just um, limits the use of those tax dollars for the promotion of abortion. Um, Are you able to do, address the access to the LARCs? Sure. Do you know much about that? So as far as 12 and 13, Okay, that number one has a prospective grammatical. There's no um, family planning grantee that shall enter into a um, new contract um, with a reproductive health facility. Those entities that have current contracts for LARCs would not be impacted uh, by this particular provision that would just be um, going forward for those new contracts. I don't want to put words in your mouth, Mr. Tierney, but I but I think what you just said is there that there is a long term issue potentially about the uh, ability of a family planning clinic to access LARPs. If, if, Mr. If, Chairman, if, may I respond, please? No, not until you're recognized. Okay, thank you. So to clarify your your statement, um, in the future, if a um, family planning grantee needed to get LARCs from somewhere, um, they would need to enter into a contract to get them from somewhere other um, than an abortion providing reproductive health facility. But that would not be immediate on an existing contract, it would only be for new contracts. So there would be time to find out whether they get them from Dartmouth Hitchcock um, or some other uh, provider um, that is not um, a 13237 provider. Thank, thank you for your answer and thank you for keeping it relatively short. So, uh, Ms. Stoddard, was that you who had yeah. another comment? Go ahead, yes, please. Thank you, sir. Um, I am an attorney and our health centers, the FQHCs, I am not their attorney. However, they consulted with their legal counsel and our National Association of Community Health Centers that they all belong to and that by state belongs to and their auditors. They cannot currently participate in the Title X program because of this gag rule, which is almost identical to the one that you're looking at now that Attorney Tierney rep, um, mentioned. If this were to go into place, those FQHCs would likely be in the same situation and they could not participate in the family planning program. I understand that the word shall enter is prospective, but their contracts expire. With all due respect, they expire, and this would oh, limit I, their ability. I, I, I agree with that. We we only have about fifteen more minutes, and, and sure. we have three more people. So I, I think I think you've added your point to the record. Thank you so much. Uh, I see a Rebecca McBeath. McBeth is that is that Representative McBeath? Can we just find out if you're Representative McBeath? Yes, um, Chair Edwards, this is uh, Becky Macbeth, representative from Portsmouth. 
Thank you. May oh, I? You're, you're, you're recognized for three minutes. And uh, again, the same rooms of the rules of decorum. Thank you. Um, I have two points I wanted to mention. One, going back earlier to the, um, the professional advice, the, the dangers of limiting that. As a practicing attorney in New Hampshire, the only restriction I know on my right uh, to advise my clients to a variety of options um, is criminal activity. I cannot engage and counsel them in criminal activity. And so since abortion is not criminal activity, I think that we're really, uh, it's dangerous to take a medical professional and eliminate any type of options that they might feel is appropriate to talk to their clients about. And then number two, um, my, um, you know, the, the sponsor, um, our colleague from Derry, I think she actually really um, said what I wanna say about this bill and what I'd like you to remember. She said that um, these clinics um, are going right up to the edge of the law. Um, the law is that no funds, no state or federal funds can be provided for abortion services. And they're not. This law takes it over the edge. Um, and I, I, so I really ask you to recall that. I know this is a controversial issue and people are looking to try to push their you know, viewpoints. But represent, uh, uh, please don't imply motive or, or intention to your opposition. Just re represent your own position, please. I, I apologize. I didn't realize that I was doing that. I was recognizing the controversial of the issue and I was quoting um, my colleague who I respect that she had said that um, the current uh, funding sources, went, I mean, the current clinics are using the funding right up to the edge of the law. So thank you very much for the time to speak. All right, uh, well, thank you. Um, uh, that was under two minutes and I appreciate you uh, testifying today. Um, I, I think the next person to have raised their hand was uh, Ms. Kayla Montgomery. Could you uh, come in and introduce yourself, please, and, and, and share with us what you know or think? Sure. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Kayla Montgomery. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood of Northern New England and Planned Parenthood of New Hampshire Action Fund. And we strongly oppose this amendment because it is a gag rule on safety net providers. A gag rule prevents healthcare organizations that receive government funds from mentioning or providing education, consultation, or referrals for abortion. This proposed amendment interferes with patient provider relationships and would force providers to violate their duty to provide information that is complete, accurate, and honest to patients or be defunded. This amendment is identical to the Trump administration's gag rule. And when that was implemented in 2019, a majority of New Hampshire Title Fund providers pulled out of the program rather than comply with medically unethical rules. Therefore, it is safe to assume that if this amendment passes, the majority of Title Fund providers, including those who don't perform abortion, would again be forced to pull out of state funding rather than lie to their patients. While the federal gag rule is expected to be reversed, there are no timelines available yet. So passage of this amendment means that providers wouldn't be able to receive state or federal funds, which of course is funding that these organizations rely on to provide quality and affordable care to grant staters. So to be perfectly clear, this will defund health centers during a pandemic. This imposes totally unnecessary physical separation requirements, which are completely impossible to comply with. And these requirements serve absolutely no logical purpose and are only designed to force Planned Parenthood and other health centers that provide abortion out of operation. But if passed, it will have a dramatic, a drastic and immediate effect across our state for patients who are most vulnerable. And I also wanna say for the record that government funds can never go to abortion care. Patients must use private insurance or self-pay for abortion. All funds are completely segregated and funds are never commingled. C4 advocacy is also not commingled. For example, PPNE has a sister organization called Planned Parenthood New Hampshire Action Fund, which is a C4 organization. Planned Parenthood of Northern New England has 21 health centers in Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire, and is a trusted, reliable source of compassionate and affordable health care in New Hampshire for over 50 years. 30 PPNE seconds. Has, sorry. What? 30 seconds. Okay, I will skip ahead. Um, I just also want to mention that someone said that uh, folks could go to alternative medical providers, which that was mentioned by the sponsor. 
I'll note that those providers don't care for people on a sliding scale, um, which is often no cost. In 2020, Planned Parenthood Northern New England provided 2.4 million in free or discounted care to our most vulnerable citizens. And I also wanna uh, point out that the sponsor mentioned that this is an identical, um, this is identical amendment to a, an item back in 2017, but what the sponsor didn't mention is that that amendment was soundly defeated um, because it is bad for public health outcomes. Thank so I urge, okay, I, I just urge you all to stand with the hundreds of medical organizations and providers and public health officials uh, who oppose gag rules like these and please just defeat this amendment. And if time, I would love to talk about the larger issue. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So Representative Walner, I, I apologize. I've been looking at the attendees and you've, I don't know how long you've had your hand up. Uh, Representative Walner, do you have a question or, or, or pertinent comment here that you, you wanna make? Well, you know, actually I think that um, Ms. Montgomery is the right, is probably the person I should be asking this question of. Could you just tell me how this would affect um, hospitals? Would this have an effect on our, our hospitals? It would have an effect on hospitals who are in the Title X program, um, which I believe there are a few. And so, yeah, it would, uh, would mean that they wouldn't be eligible for state funding. So it's my understanding that this uh, legislation is strictly targeting reproductive health clinics. And in the New Hampshire RSAs, uh, that's defined pretty clearly as, uh, as not being hospitals. So it's not being an attorney, it's, it's my understanding that it wouldn't affect hospitals at all, even those that do provide abortion services, which are, can oftentimes be essential to saving the life of a mother. So, so I, I, I don't know that that, can you, could you clarify whether you really think it's hospitals as well? Because uh, online, let's see, what is it? Line uh, 18, it talks about promotion, referral, or support of abortion as a method of family planning. So if someone, if a Title X provider who happens to be a hospital, uh, if a patient comes in and they do not want to be, they're pregnant and they do not want to be pregnant, then that would say that the, provide, the hospital couldn't give medically accurate care to that patient. All right. Th thank you for the clarification. I, I think I think that there's an interpretation difference is all, uh, but I do appreciate um, your, your opinion on it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative um, Waller, did you have a follow up? No, I just I was just curious as to how this would um, affect hospitals. And I think um, I heard from Ms. Montgomery that it would affect them. Thank you. Okay, I would just ask you to take a look at line four of the amendment. And uh, this bill is pertaining to reproductive health care facilities as defined in RSA 132-37. And I, I, I think that's the limitation of the scope of the impact of this amendment, um, but I'm not a lawyer. Okay. But to be clear. So we're gonna uh, move on. Um, if you have additional commentary, uh, please send, send us send us an email, call us, but we, we need to keep moving. I, I see uh, Representative Love. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't call on you sooner, sir. I didn't see you. Would you, would you please uh, begin your testimony? You have three minutes and I would encourage you to re maintain decorum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name's uh, Representative David Love. I represent uh, Rockingham Six, uh, which is Derry. Um, I, I do want to uh, point out that uh, in my uh, in my walking around town, knocking on doors and campaigning, uh, the the overwhelming feeling of the people of Derry is no money for for reproductive health care facilities. Uh, they they do not want to have any anything to do with funding abortion. This um. This amendment will, will open up bidding for, for starters. I haven't heard anybody uh, mention that. Uh, there'll, there'll be much more bidding uh, by, by healthcare facilities uh, to, to help the, the poor and indigent of our, our state. It'll give the, uh, give the state um, you know, a, a, a better break. A, the business will be better. Uh, more, more providers, uh, you know, cheaper services for, for, the, for the state. And um, you know, the, um, as far as uh, uh, you know, limiting uh, you know the 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 reproductive health care uh, facilities now, and uh, you know what they can do. Um, 
the, the, I, I always like to refer to the billing as, as a big problem. Uh, you know, uh, it, when you when you're allowed to commingle mingle funds, uh, you could uh, a bill could possibly read, and there'd be nothing stopping them from doing this. Uh, you know, your initial phone call uh, to to a reproductive health care center, uh, two hundred dollars. You know, uh, initial office visit, two hundred and fifty dollars. Medication, three hundred dollars. And look at that, the abortion only costs thirty bucks. Um, you know, and, and in reality, the 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 state is paying for the abortion. It's there's nothing to prevent that. Uh, Right now, uh, you know, the, that, that's the way our laws are. If this amendment is adopted, uh, the, the, the poor and indigent people, the people that really need this, this funding uh, will be served much better. Uh, the, there'll be no commingling of funds. There'll, no, there'll be no big executives' uh, salaries uh, uh, being paid for by our state, state funding. Uh, there'll be no yeah. lobbyists being paid for by One our minute. state funding. Um, and, uh, you know, that, 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 like I said, I'm, uh, I'm in wholehearted uh, support of this amendment. And, uh, and that's it, Jess. Thank you, Representative Love. Now, you were well within three minutes, too. I appreciate that. I, I see uh, Representative Min, um, um, Minahan from the New Hampshire Hospital Association. W would you introduce yourself? And, and uh... Good morning, um, Representative Edwards. For the record, Paula Minahan, State Government Relations um, for the New Hampshire Hospital Association. I um, just wanted to make sure that um, um, that you understand, and I just wanted to confirm what um, Ms. Montgomery said, that some of the hospitals, the way we interpret this language, um, and I, this is the first I'm actually seeing this, um, but the way I um, previously um, understood the gag rule um, that yes, some hospitals with Title X funding would in fact be impacted by this. I think this raises a larger issue um, that was raised earlier that this really um, is, is kind of a co complex issue and I think it deserves um, separate discussion and a separate hearing. I was not prepared to testify today at all. Um, again, this is the first I'm seeing this, but I just want, I know the um, Representative Wollner asked if hospitals are impacted. I am not a lawyer, um, but others that have testified are, um, and I do believe though from talking with others in the past that yes, hospitals would be impacted. Furthermore, I'm just concerned about the access to care for our most vulnerable, especially during the pandemic and what this potentially could do to impact that access, um, which we are um, very concerned about and um, would not want to see any um, access be limited for important services to, to our um, citizens in New Hampshire. So, um, and I, I am sure um, that the the clinics um, that provide um, family planning services because they receive federal funding are subject to audits. Um, so I'm, I am sure that they um, have gone through those audits and I'm sure Ms. Montgomery and others could ad address that. But again, due to limited time, um, I will stop my comments, but happy, to, I will stay on if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Representative. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I. I I think to your point about not not having had an opportunity to fully prepare for today, uh, I, I think you have a, a, a valid point. Um, uh, the HB2 process is inherently less transparent than our normal procedures for policy committees, which is why I've made an effort to get the amendment out there uh, in the most public way I could and to, you know, alert particular individuals with interest that I knew to have interest in the subject to invite them to come participate. Um, and so, so and, and we're holding this hearing or meeting like a hearing in order to, um, to at least leverage some of the policy committee procedures. So if, if um, to your concern about not having enough time to prepare, one of two things will happen. We're either gonna uh, uh, vote this amendment down, in which case you, you you, your testimony uh, was sufficient, or if we pass it, uh, you have another bite at the apple uh, when the Senate uh, looks at their HB2. So uh, I, think we're, I think we're in midstream of a conversation at this point. So, um, Mr. I, I see you panelists. Let's see what's going on over here. 
Uh, Representative Norgren, do you have your hand up? Um, probably this is out of turn, but I think the comments that have been made um, make it even more obvious that this bill should have its own hearing in the Health and Human Services Committee. So I hope that's something the committee will consider. Thanks. Thank you. And um, Mr. Tierney, I, I see your hand is up. And I would ask you, sir, um, to if you in your um, coming remarks that you just address very specific things that you've heard uh, so that the committee has the information it needs to make a decision. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so as it pertains to the impact of this language on hospitals. What is currently the case right now in the 2021 is that there is one hospital, Concord Hospital, that is participating in the um, family planning program and is complying um, with the federal Title X language, which is where this language comes from. Um, so I just wanted to make clear um, in the record um, that if a hospital decided to operate a state funded family planning program as it states in line 14, then it would need to comply with lines 14 through 20. Um, and that um, currently uh, Concord Hospital is complying uh, with this language, which is uh, federal language. So Mr. Tierney, I think you just corrected a, a bad observation I made earlier. It, 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 because of line 14 down, it could, uh, possibly uh, affect programs that are hospital-based and not just reproductive health clinic-based, or is that true? A state-funded family planning program that is run by a hospital would be affected by lines 14 through 20 if they applied for and ran a family planning program. So I was wrong. So, so thank you for uh, clarifying that. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, I don't, let's go back to the attendees for a second and I can do that. I have a clicker. Um, I think the people with their hands up have all had an opportunity to speak. And so um, at this point, uh, I'm, I think uh, we can stop discussion on section 34. And I believe uh, we're scheduled for a vote on section 34 uh, on Monday. Um, let me check to see if that's accurate. Okay, it's not it's not on my working schedule, but I'll add it to my working schedule that that will take a vote on um, section 34 um, on um, on Monday, which I guess Mr. Ripple, you you want to remind me that you have to convert that into an OLS drafted amendment so that, oh, it already is. So we this have one is, yes. Yeah, okay. All right, well, so I'm partially learning. Um, all right, uh, with that, I, I think we're through talking about um, section 34. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tierney, for all your work. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone who's come in and testified. Um, this is a this is a conversation that we'll be continuing to have. So, all right, has um, has a dynamic duo of MMIS come in, Mr. Waters and uh, Mr. Goulet? Are they available? Let me see. Looks like Commissioner Goulet is in the audience. I could bring him in. Got five or six people. We have five or six people from the previous conversation that need to uh, be released. Okay. And actually, uh, because there are a number of people in the attendees list, if you could actually raise your hand if you expect to come in as a part of this conversation, that would make things easier. Thank you. So you know who you should remove, though, right? Mike Tierney, Representative Oregon. Ms. Nelson, Ms. Minahan. There's, yes. uh, there's, there's Mr. Littman. Welcome.
I think you got everyone, Kevin. Um, About, okay. Attorney Chair. Okay. So, so let's, let's do the simple one first. Let's do the section that's related to the $200,000 for um, the ADT HL7 transactions. It, it's, do you know which one I'm referring to? I'm sorry, I was I was trying to uh, do something else at the time. Could you repeat that, please? Uh, I'll, I'll be more specific here in just a second. Okay. Uh, I'm, section I'm, 38. Section 38. 38, thank you. I told you. Okay, and then if you can share section 38, um, outstanding. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll let whoever wants to speak to this, go ahead and start the conversation. But I just wanna, uh, what we're looking for is clarification here. And I'm probably the, the person most confused about this because um, as I look at this, it, it seems to me that we have information systems that we've set up to fire uh, ADT HL7 event notification out to specified other uh, inter through other interfaces to other systems so that they can use that ADT event notification to plan coordinate and coordinate uh, ongoing patient care. Um, and if, if that is an accurate assumption of what we're doing here, then I, I don't understand what would cost $200,000 if the initial setup of the ADT HL7 message has already been invested in. So, so, so that's the point where I'm confused. Who, who would like to speak to that? I think Dave and Henry um, can provide more information. Oh. I can start representing Edwards and Chair. Thank you, Chair. This is David Weeders, Information Services Director for Health and Human Services. Um, that was an accurate um, description of what was implemented as part of the 1115 district waiver with um, many of the providers across the state. However, it wasn't just the admission discharge transfer component. It was also an uh, implementation of a shared care plan network and it's the ongoing cost to maintain that system as well as expand that, that system into the Seacoast area that is not currently on, online and, can, and continue to maintain the um, implementation that just completed recently at New Hampshire Hospital. So that $200,000 that's listed there is actually the general fund share of of the overall cost to support this system on an annual basis going forward. Um, the funding for this solution expired in December of 2020. The, the providers actually were able to sustain the solution through June 30th of 2021 on their own funds. And we, we're looking to continue that network of sharing to, so that we were able to Keep, that, keep the hospitals, primary care clinics, behavioral health, community mental health centers, the post-acute facilities and payers um, in constant communication to realize the, the, the benefits that we've, had, that we've seen over the last couple of years. So we've, we've seen benefits of this shared care plan and, and admission discharge transfer um, program, reducing the number of emergency department visits per month, as well as the average time patients spend in the ED has declined by over, or just under 10%, which essentially relates to how many Medicaid claims come in as a result of those visits in the ED. I, 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 did, I know that you guys have to leave here shortly, so I'm sorry to cut you off, but uh, I, I think there's probably universal uh, agreement that it's a good policy and that the shared uh, care plans 
or is, is just good healthcare policy. So it, I'm, I'm really just looking at the, the, the money and the way we're delivering the money. I, it, it, it sounds to me like a few things are true, that, that, that I don't know who drafted this, but it, it sounds like as drafted, it doesn't really do what you just described the need to be. It's, it, and, and so I'm just wondering if, if we keep this as an HB2 item, if it's really as precise as it should be so that it, it funds the program that, that I just heard you describe. I think it does because it does say to support expanded and continued. So I, I think the language is broad enough that it would support what Dave just described. Okay, so, but this is money that's intended to be sent to healthcare providers to help them pay for their interfaces to our system. So, and isn't it? Or did I mishear you? I apologize, Chair. Um, actually, it's for us to contract with collective medical technologies to maintain that system for the providers that, that leverage it today. So we would, con we would continue to support that system um, ongoing from for the next biennium and, and then from there. So we would not be providing the funds to the providers. We would be contracting with collective medical technologies, which is currently in place for this solution to to expand and continue that admission discharge transfer. Which also includes okay. New Hampshire Hospital. Okay, thank you. So, so why, at what point would we not see this as an HB2 any longer, that it would just be incorporated into the ongoing operation operating budget of the state? Why, why is this still an HB2 instead of just absorbed into a line within HB1? So the, I think the, I think I had described earlier that this item was realized that we left it out of the budget too late in the process. And so HB1 had already been finalized. And so the governor's office put it in HB2. So there's no reason it can't, cannot be moved to HB1. So if we, if we just put 200,000 in HB1, we, could, we don't need 38 because you already have authority under your ongoing operations to do this. Correct, and what to Dave's point, something that I had forgot about, which is embarrassing, but uh, we would also need to add the federal funds that would match to that 200,000. So we have another revenue stream to consider. Yes. But if, right. if you would like, I can do a change request and provide it to Kevin for what that would look like and where it would go. I, I don't, I don't, I'm tempted to say yes, but I, I want to hear uh, from the other committee members if there's any question or conversation around this. I'm not, I'm not seeing any hands up. Um, I, I, I think I'd like to do something with this, I, whether we, 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 we move it back into HB1 as part of the ongoing operations and you add back the federal revenue number or I, I, I just, I, I don't, I, I'm not a big fan of HB2 to begin with. Uh, I know it's necessary, but I'd rather minimize its use if we don't need it. So if you, Representative Erf, please, please tackle me if I'm going in the wrong direction. Go ahead. No, I just want to say that I agree. If Karen's able to provide the information for us to incorporate it into HB1, both the general and the federal funds, that seems to be the best solution going forward. Ripple, would you get ready to show the section of the governor's budget related to MMIS, please? Sure. So, okay, so Ms. Rounds, I guess I am asking you to, to, to work with Kevin um, and whether we, we fix it because we're running out of time or uh, the Senate has an opportunity to, 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 to uh, fix is the wrong word, that assumes it's broken, but to, to modify it, um, you know, just give, give us some feedback. I, I don't think it's the most important thing we're working on right now, but it's, 
I think it's in the worth doing category. All right. So I think we're ready to talk about the MMIS portion of the budget again. And um, just, to, just to frame this, uh, Mr. Goulet, welcome. Sir, I know you're very busy as, as everyone is, but um, as we went through um, a funding exercise the other day as a committee going from the FY21 base up to the amount of money that we thought we may have available from a, ways and, a previous ways and means estimate, we started to run out of money as we discussed the MMIS portion of our priorities. And, and, um, and it's just a lot of operating money in FY 22 and 23. And we had some testimony from Senator Clegg who gave us a 10 year history. Um, he, he, he cited some real systemic problems that, that the department has had prior to your arrival, prior to Mr. Wetter's arrival, prior to the commissioner's arrival. Um, but, but historically, the department uh, has had problems effectively and efficiently implementing large IT sy uh, systems. And so, so as we look at this, it's a lot of money and, 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 and we'd, like to, we'd like to have confidence if it gets spent that you have the right people and a good plan. And, and so I'll, I'll stop there and just let you all address that how you wish. Well, I'll start, uh, Mr. Chair um, and members of the committee. Um, for the record, my name's Dennis Goulet. I'm the commissioner of the Department of Information Technology. Um, you know, I, I haven't been party to the, the previous testimony on, on MMIS, but certainly we've had our challenges uh, as, as a state, as all states do with MMIS, um, because it's, uh, you know, typically the largest and most complex system. It has a lot of political sides to it because of, because of how, you know, the, the, the citizen impact uh, and, and the total dollars that are, that are expended through MMIS and the fact that policies tend to change fairly rapidly, particularly as, as uh, party control um, ebbs and flows. Um, that said, um, the uh, DHEGES team and my team, um, at this point, um, I'm coming up on six years as commissioner. Uh, we're at the best place we've been so far since I've been here as it relates to um, effective management of our systems overall, but really in particular MMIS. We have a, a strong team on the business side, with HHS with David Weeders and Henry Lookman's team. Our DOIT team that's embedded in MMIS is firing extremely well right now. Um, the uh, David and Karen have put together a budget that fairly represents what is required to run this extremely important program. Uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, and hoping that if you've had a chance to look at the life cycle considerations that, that um, David and myself have worked on with respect to that large and complex system that we work with uh, the governor's office on as well, um, you'll see that we have a, a good long-term plan that not only will keep, um, keep our Medicaid program running well, but will also do it at a more predictable cost over time. I will, that ends my formal comments, but I'm happy to answer. I, 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 I appreciate that. And, and I, I, you know, just to let people know, uh, you, you've been willing to talk to me for the, the past four years and, and help me understand what's going on with your strategic planning process. And, and I, I've seen the improvement in the professionalism of how the, of your, your organization and the department's IT group is, has been improving over, you know, over the last four years. So, so I, I, I have confidence in you. I, I, uh, I'm going to uh, let you uh, ask a question here in a second, uh, Representative Irf, if you still have one. But, but so, so, uh, so, so I'm going to respond just from a large IT project planning perspective. As I look at 
um, the authorizations and vacancies in the IT staff of the department, I see 12 people on hand and 10 vacancies out of the 22 authorizations for um, um, as of March 11th. And so, uh, and I see an immediate opportunity to begin spending $12.5 million on July 1. And so I am just concerned about the practical ability to, to hire the right people with the right skills and experience, get them onboarded properly and oriented, particularly in a pandemic world where nobody can talk to each other face to face, then immediately pivot to implementing an expensive large scale project on starting July 1. And so I'm just curious what, what you all have, and then again, anyone can respond to this, but. But I'm just curious if you have a project plan that you've reviewed and that you have the human capabilities necessary to, to pull this off on a timeline where you need that much money in the first year. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to give a, a broad response and um, then I would ask that uh, David Weeders to comment as well. But, um, you know, the we're we're looking at a couple things here, right? We're looking at a, a continuing and ongoing prog, uh, program, right? And funding that it, as it's as we're contractually committed to. Um, and then we're looking at um, the, the life cycle considerations of the existing contract. And then we're also looking at, at the um, re-procurement over time. Um, in terms of recruiting IT talent, um, we, we haven't had, um, as much trouble as I have heard some of my peers in other states um, recruiting in New Hampshire, I think it's a couple things. We're pretty close to the Boston job market, and we have a, um, you know, we have a, a, a better um, quality of life. And you know, if you're not commuting down 93 or Route 3, that means a lot. Um, the other thing that's happened too is I've, I've observed that um, the fact that the culture and performance of DOIT and our relationships with the agencies our improved relationships with the agencies, which you have observed and commented on, um, has, hasn't gone unnoticed. Um, for example, if we bring a contractor in for a um, making fairly high salary through, through contracting, it's not unusual to have them want to come to work for us um, at the end of their contract. In fact, I have a couple right now I'd love to hire if I had the open position. The open positions that you referred to, I'm not certain what they are. I, I might want to qualify that, but I know that we did, uh, DOIT did unfund a number of positions to make our general fund targets at the governor's phase. And, and division one has been considering refunding some of those positions. I think that's what you're referring to, but I'm not certain. Uh, could, could you qualify, please? Yes, sir. That's a that's a fair question. I I, I don't I, I'm not paying attention to Division Three at this point. I'm just talking about Division Three, the the, the DHHS uh, line for IT uh, has uh, 22 authorized, 12 hired, 10 vacant. I think okay. as of the 11th of March. Yeah, I'll I'll let the DHHS folks comment on that. So um, again, Chair, those positions I believe are, are, that you might be referring to are the information services positions in my group in, that are supporting the PMO, as well as our security, lifecycle management, and, um, and data warehousing. For the MMIS specifically, we have several positions, I believe it's six that were vacant and were unfunded. Um, uh, four of which were unfunded in this biennium, the current biennium, that we were asking to fund um, fund a total of four positions in the next biennium. And then associated with the Alvarez and Marcel report, we're also hiring a two additional project managers um, to assist with the re-procurement efforts. So what we'll have is, uh, we'll, we'll be, we currently have posted an MMIS director position uh, full-time position as well as a part-time position to facilitate the leadership alongside 
DOIT, myself, and, and Henry Lippman's team for that strategic planning and direction. Um, leveraging the DOIT embedded team for that ongoing life cycle management, which they've done, been doing a great job of the initial step of the tech stack upgrade. And we would anticipate uh, nothing less for the second phase of that tech stack, the technical stack upgrade. Um, and then those, those two additional project managers that I alluded to from the Alvarez and Marcel report recommendation would be really focused on building those RFPs working with across the teams to do successful procurements and implementations over the next biennium. So when it comes to that project plan um, and resources, we, we do recognize that we are um, at a, a deficiency in terms of staffing to be able to, to do this, but it's also in our operating budget to hire those, those staff members and have them onboarded. Um, again, recognizing um, Chair, that the complexity of onboarding people into um, IT and IS positions and specifically with Medicaid experience, we've, we've actually found that it's been successful in bringing people with more generalized um, backgrounds and training them, bringing them on board with our Medicaid program, that that has, been, that has been a successful method of, of learning. It takes about four to six months to do that but we think it's actually right in line with our plans for, for that rate procurement and the tech stack upgrade. Okay, so, um, so I, I think you are seeing that you have about a, I'm, I'm, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but what I'm hearing is you've, you've got a six month lag to really hire the full team that you need to take on this project. And so we're talking about maybe October-ish. Um, and, and so I'll just come back to the question of, is 12.5 million in general funds in the current year starting July 1, really the right amount of money, given that it's hard to imagine your team being really ready to confidently and effectively run this project. I'm, I'm just trying to make sure we don't create a situation where there's potential waste. Understood, um, Chair. So when you're referring to the 12.5 million um, in, in this, on the screen shared here, can you, ex can you qualify what that 12.5 you're referring to so I can address it properly? Yes, yes sir, that's a, that's a fair question. Do you see the shared screen? Oh, I, I see the general fund 12.5 million. Is that what you're referring to? That's exactly, it's 12.486552. Thank you. So this operating budget specifically as it breaks down is associated with two, two contracts, one's with conduit and one's with NTT data. And so the general fund costs of that line 102 um, for that 45 million that the majority of which I think all, all of which is listed here is associated with contracts with conduit and NTT data. So the conduit contract is the lion's share of that. And that's the, our system integrator, our provider services, our claims management system, our third party liability, our electronic data interface, um, actually our data warehouses in there and a number of other modules to support the Medicaid program. And that's actually if you estimate the number of people that are supporting that system from conduit, it's upwards of 130 people that are working on that system to support that work. The, the increase that you see from, from a previous biennium to this biennium, as a result of we were not funded for our operating budget in this current fiscal year, um, I, th I think Karen or Athena might be on to be able to tell the exact number but we're bringing that up to date. So we are funded for the actual budget. Plus we have had a, we have um, deferred maintenance on that system. So our Oracle, our IBM licensing and pretty much all of our infrastructure for software is end of support and end of, end, end of um, life, which normally in some cases you could defer that maintenance and continue. However, it puts us at risk for um, um, decertification from CMS, which would have a $6.6 .6 million penalty on our general fund impacts. So what we were, 
what you have in there is actually the increased work is to do that life cycle management or that technical stack upgrade, which I would say 70% of the work is conduit. And then the other 30% is the DIT, DHHS com combined team sort of strategically and, and through leadership directing conduit to do the work. And, and then the, the remaining contract, the MTT data contract is the quality assurance contract that is required by Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. It, it did not increase um, this year. It was, but it is required for us to get our federal matching dollars to do a third party quality assurance review. So, so, so just to make sure I'm tracking, this, this is money you're paying a vendor to maintain your legacy system. And your legacy system is old enough to where you have critical components of it that are coming out, coming towards their end of life, end of support. Um, so, so, and 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 because of if we don't maintain it, we're going to potentially lose some CMS certification due to what? Due to a lack of adequate security due to what, what, why would they remove our certification if the system is still operating? So they, they require us to have uh, support contracts with all of our vendors and maintaining patches of all the systems, the IBM and Oracle specifically, um, I could go through the other ones, but those two companies have indicated in writing to Conduit that they will not support the system, nor will they provide critical patches for security or, or function unless we upgrade. And so, and that, that's where, when they put that in writing, which is basically the last, last thing that the vendors do is when they do that, then, they, then we're at risk where if Conduit can't support it and it fails, then the system would just fail and we would have no vendor, manage, vendor support. Right. Um, so, the, so just to follow up again, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know when do you guys have to leave. I, I, I know we don't want to talk all day about this, but you all have a hard stop where you have to leave, I think. Um, so, so in the first year, uh, it's 12.5 million basically. In the second year, it's 13.1. Um, it sounds like you're saying that uh, your vendor can provide you with an upgrade that will bring those component licenses up to date and therefore remain a supported system overall. That is correct. There, there are a couple other components that were in our testimony earlier um, that this money also supports, which is by a CMS passed uh, interoperability and patient access final rule that impacted both MMIS as well as that earlier conversation with the emission discharge transfer system where we needed to put in place um, changes in the MMIS for member access to data. So a component of this general fund increase is the, the annual maintenance for that, which is estimated at $900,000 per year to support that, um, those changes from CMS, as well as there's penalties in here for us not implemented the electronic visit verification in by January 1st, 2021. And we didn't implement that as a result of not having the funds approved in the previous biennium capital request. And, and th that's why you see the increase in general fund um, allocation from 22 to 23, the penalties. How, keep how much did that cost us? How much did that penalty cost us? Do you know? Or does so, Ms. Rounds know? The estimated, um, I'll go ahead, Karen. No, go ahead, Dave. The estimated, um, impacts for this 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 coming year is $864,000. And then the following year is $1.3 million in penalties of which the EVV system to avoid those penalties is, and those are general fund um, penalties. The general fund cost to implement an EVV system is, is estimated at $564,000. Yeah. Okay. I I, I guess I have one more question around the, the 25 million over the biennium. Do you, it sounds to me like you've talked to your vendors and these are, these are really firm price estimates for the contract modifications. Or are they, or are they still estimates? These look pretty precise. And it sounds like you're saying you, you've come to an agreement with your vendors. 
they, they were precise estimates at the time of submittal. However, since submittal, I continue to work on negotiations to reduce those costs. We haven't finalized the contracts. So the final contract should be coming to the governor and executive council for approval within the next um, month and a half, at which time we will have, um, have those numbers. I won't ask you what you're expecting for a reduction because I don't want to lock you in and just saying a number is going to do that effectively. But can you can you tell me for sure that it's you're in a not to exceed position with these numbers and that you may end up coming in less and as a result, some of this may lapse back to the Treasury. I would I would defer to Karen on that. I'll comment because I, I don't get involved in the lapse process. Yes, whatever is not spent will lapse. Okay, so Representative Irf, do you have any questions? Does anyone on the committee have any questions? Uh, Representative Irf, you're recognized. Just to clarify, I think this is what you were saying. I was looking back at the prior by and budget and it showed $3 million budgeted for both. 20 and 21, which seems consistent with what you show for the adjusted actual for 21 general fund dollars I'm talking. I'm, I'm guessing you were aware of these concerns two years ago and and you made them aware to us, I just can't recall. Uh, and, and you just, the funds weren't allocated so you, you couldn't take advantage of the last two years to start this process. Thank you, Representative Murph and, and Chair for the question. D. Um, over the last two bienniums previously, um, specifically for biennium 2021, we did submit a capital project for MMIS lifecycle management. It might have been named something different. It was not funded, so we need we deferred we continued to defer maintenance. The previous biennium, we had a capital request that was to do all of the work. Uh, we were funded at a fraction of that and at amount of, I think 26 million. We initially asked for upwards of 50 million to do the work. And so we have been requesting over time to get the capital funds to maintain the system. And in, in, the, case, in the case of uh, the, the capital budgets, we were not funded to do this. So we continue to bring them up to the capital group uh, for public, public works review. And then associated with capital, there's always operating costs after you implement so the, the I, and so I think I saw something in the chat, so, so maybe someone can reflect. I, I believe the 3 million that you're referring to is the adopted budget versus what we actually submitted. Um, Karen so or, we, we brought forward close to $7 million to continue paying for MMIS as well as transferred in another six and a half in general funds. So, so the cost was much higher than what was budgeted. So, 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 Mr. Galay, you're just part of a conversation here. If you want to, if you want to add comment, go ahead, sir. Well, um, I appreciate the conversation about the uh, life cycle considerations and the deferred maintenance, and and it, it was a bit of a theoretical, uh, in my view, it was a good financial conversation. I wanted to bring in the the aspect of um, you know these. This deferred maintenance, putting us in a position where uh, stuff isn't being passed for security reasons, that represents a risk of, of citizen data as well. And I wanna make sure that that's in the public record that, that you know, it's our, all of our responsibilities to do our best to protect citizen data. And this is sensitive citizen data. And it's really important that we, that, that we fund this, um, this, this uh, refresh um, to, to, I think, do what is our basic uh, to perform our basic responsibility in that in that role. So, so just Thank to you. make sure I understand that risk you're laying out there for us, I, I, I assume that one source of that risk is if we have an Oracle database with sensitive data in it and it's beyond its service support and therefore it's not getting patches, it's not getting the security patches that it needs. And therefore, as we age past that, we become increasingly vulnerable as hackers get to know of our vulnerabilities. That, that's true, sir. Hand is still up. I'm, are there any other uh, uh, 
questions here. Uh, Mr. Lipman, you've, uh, you, you've joined us. I appreciate it. And I'm sorry for all the tech talk, but uh, do you have something you'd like to add, sir? I would <clears throat> I just say that the risk that Dennis uh, spoke about, um, the risk to our um, provider network of not being able to perform and the risk to the state budget, I think there are a lot of risks here that were maybe two years ago when the budget was considering maybe seemed a little bit theoretical. Now they're real and um, we really need your support on this uh, request. Do you still have something? Thank you, sir. Do you still have something for us, Mr. Gillay? Your hands up. I don't want to ignore it. Uh, yeah, you, you, you called on me right after I put my hand up. So I thought that was, you were just really quick on that, but no, I'm, I'm good. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, all right, I, I, I do want to put one thing on the record. Um, uh, since the last time I think I did a Zoom with uh, Mr. Wieters on, on the call, I, I've had uh, two random resumes sent to me by people interested in going to work for the department. And I don't know who these people are. And as a, as a courtesy, uh, I forwarded those resumes to Mr. Waiters without recommendation, just information. And I'm refer, I, he's taught me how to refer people to the online job, job application service for, for other people to apply. Um, but uh, I just wanted to make sure you knew I wasn't pressuring you to hire those people because I don't know them. I just am passing their resumes. Uh, do you have a, you, you just put your hand up or not? I was just going to say, Chair, thank you for sending those. They are, they did follow the, the formal process to apply and we, we will be reaching out accordingly based off of their, um, their qualifications. And I appreciate, um, I appreciate anyone that's able to send um, people to, to that job portal to make referrals for them to work for state of New Hampshire. So thank you for doing that. Totally your call, what you, what you do with the information provided you. Totally your call. Understood. Uh, Mr. Glay, your hand is still up. So I'll, I'll just keep coming back to you until you put it down. Okay, I'll put it down. <laughs> All right. So um, are there any questions from the committee? Um, all right. So I, I think this was important testimony. Like I, 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 and we probably had heard all of this once before, but the importance of hearing it uh, increased when we went through a, a budget exercise and we found this money right at the cusp of what we considered to be available for investment. So, um, so it was, I think it's important that you came in and you, and you brought us back up to speed and reminded us of stuff that we maybe had forgotten. So um, I, what, what section have we been talking about? Is this section 30? Uh, we did talk about 30, 38. And then this has just been the MIS budget. I, unless you guys have any, uh, or gals, if there's a gal out there, uh, if you have any questions or comments before we, we move on, uh, I think we're ready to move on. Do we have any questions from the committee? I, I for some reason, I'm, my view is not as good as it normally is. I don't see any questions from the committee and I'm not seeing any more comments from our guests. So, so, so thank you very much. I appreciate you coming by. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, yeah. uh, I think the next section is the section uh, with Alvarez and Marcel, and there are several people that Kevin needs to bring over. So might I request a five minute break while we do that and have a chance to use the restroom? Uh, thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate uh, that. Let's let's do that. It's uh, it's 1115 and we'll start back up at around 1120. Right, and if the A&M attendees could raise their hand, that will make it a little easier for Kevin. I sent him the list of names, but that'll make it easier. Thanks. We've got a document that Kevin can share. That'd be great too. Uh, um, I am, I'm prepared to screen share if that makes it easier okay. for, for Kevin. It does, it does, okay. thank you. Great. Uh, just whatever you're sharing, I we probably need to put on the LBA website as well. 
I'm actually going to pull it right off the LBA website, so it'll be perfect. It, it's 1120. I'm, I'm ready when uh, our guests are ready. Great. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So I'm going to start over here. This is um, section 35 is the section 
that we're talking about here. This is the $10,043,000 meant to implement the uh, A&M um, findings. So going over to the LBA website here, this is where you'll find the reports. Uh, what I would mention here is there are uh, the report and the presentation for 1A and then 1B. Uh, the report and the presentation for each of the phases are very similar. Uh, so it's really about what your reading preference is, if you prefer to read slides or narrative, uh, but what you will find in the reports are is virtually identical. It, it's more just a um, what kind of what level of detail you like to read and how you like to read it. The other item which I'm going to pull up on the screen here is item 11, which is uh, tying back to that funding that's listed in HB2. And as long as the chair is good with it, I um, will turn things over to A&M to do a little bit of an introduction. There was a question yesterday about could we understand you know, what A&M was here for and what they did. And then also um, we can go through each of these and discuss what each of them are, if that works. For You're doing great. Company. Just, great. Uh, just, just, you know what you want us to know, so go for it. Okay, great. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Brendan Staller to cover um, sort of an overview and then um, we'll come back to the spreadsheet. Thank you, Karen. Uh, good morning, Chairman Edwards and committee members. Uh, my name is Brendan Stallard. I'm the project manager for the Alvarez and Marcel team. Uh, Karen asked us to provide some background uh, about our project and some context around this report that we've issued um, and which was released to you all this week, as we understand. Um, so our team was brought in to conduct an assessment of the various programs that DHHS administers and overseas um, to identify potential opportunities for increasing efficiency and effectiveness of all these available services um, with a particular focus on how COVID-19 has impacted these areas of service. And for this assessment, um, we relied on the data from the department systems, uh, policy and program documentation, best practices, as well as the experience of our subject matter experts um, to identify, to get a firm understanding of how these programs are performing where there, and where there might be opportunities to improve. Um, and so we outlined requirements um, to implement recommendations to address those opportunities. Um, and where possible, we've provided ROI estimates as well. So we focused our recommendations in a couple different areas, um, long-term supports and services, um, more specifically developmental disabilities, um, as well as behavioral health. And we found that our recommendations as they emerged fell into two broader categories, um, specifically shorter term opportunities that can be implemented within one to two years. This is, this is really the case with the, re the recommendations related to behavioral health, um, as well as the opportunities related to developmental disabilities, which while we see as pressing to address, um, would require longer term implementation phases to accomplish. Um, and so the result of this process um, coming out of this report is that the department has proposed um, these projects uh, in their budget package. Um, this, this list is really narrowed down to include the projects which we feel the department can implement, um, but would require support to do so um, but which will provide substantive impacts to the service delivery system as a whole. Um, to follow my remarks here, um, we have included members of our team today who are prepared to provide uh, a brief but more specific description of each of these projects in the proposed budget package, um, as well as to answer questions that you all may have. Let me let me make sure I understand your your use of the term budget package. Are these are these uh, I I'm, I'm seeing five line items here. Are these five budget packages or or is this one rolled into one? 
and do we already have the HP2 language inserted as, we don't have the HP2 language inserted yet, do we? No, this is all part of um, this item here. So the, the 10,043,000 uh, obviously is a little bit less than the 10,260,000. So we would have to work within um, what the governor did appropriate in HB2, uh, but all of them are funded as, all of these are technically funded as part of that HB2 appropriation. Thank you for the clarity. And so what I'll do is I can cover the first one here, uh, the 4E funding. Because Before as, you get going, this is sure. a good place to let Representative Walner ask her question. I just have one really quick one. So are these also already incorporated into House Bill 1? They are the, these, no, they are not double budgeted. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. I don't see any other questions. Great. So what I'm going to do is just cover the first one, and then I will turn it over uh, back over to different members of the A&M team to cover each of the others to talk about um, why this project is important and uh, the return on investment. So the first one, and the reason I'm talking about this first one is because as Division Three members remember from last uh, biennium, this is one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, we knew that there was a problem with our 4E funding. We knew that our claiming rates were lower than states around us, but we were really struggling to identify what our issues were. And so a and was able to do some analysis and help us uh, develop some processes that are going to improve that. So we do need to make some small changes to our computer systems uh, to be able to implement those changes. Uh, there is an anticipated uh, ROI of anywhere from two to $4 million a year in general funds, which is fairly significant. Uh, the governor's office and I talked uh, quite extensively about how to include it in the budget. Uh, my recommendation was to increase the department's lapse because we're not sure exactly what the timeline might be for making that. And uh, as Representative Earth is familiar with, it will affect probably about, hmm, I would say at least 50 different class lines because it'll be uh, the salaries and wages of employees who earn 4E as well as direct contracts with 4E. Uh, so that um, is our recommendation that you increase the lapse anywhere from two to $4 million uh, to represent this. I, I don't believe that the governor's office did end up increasing the lapse uh, as we had suggested. Any questions on that one? Questions, Representative Irv, for example. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, just to clarify that last comment, the the two to four million dollars per year is the savings. Yes. The cost is between is about half a million dollars. Is that what I would how to read the? Uh, it's actually about fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand. Okay. So, so you're suggesting decrease in the laps that's sort of recorded in the budget by the $50,000? Uh, no, I would suggest appropriating the $50,000 and increasing the laps by two to $4 million a year. I would say less than the first year, more in the second year. Okay, increase the laps. So that's to sort of count for the savings you're anticipating, is that the idea? Correct. Okay. Correct. The department will likely lapse more general funds because we've budgeted more general funds than hopefully we will need when we start earning this ex extra federal revenue. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So Ms. Rounds, I'm looking at the column headings and I'm just having a hard time tracking the projected annual savings. Is so that savings, in a column? No, the savings are not represented on this spreadsheet, but they would be within these individual reports um, on each of the findings, the potential savings are listed. Okay, so so just, just sort of let you know how busy people think that have to make decisions. It's nice to see the investments offset by the uh, savings and the return so that we can see you know, what the what the cost benefit analysis is on 
kind of all on one sheet. So sure, I can one, update this spreadsheet if you would like. No, I no, I think that's fine. I'm just talking about for future purposes. It would have been it would be nice for for me to see a cost benefit analysis per project, uh, all on one sheet. But this is I can I can work with this. Go ahead. Understood. Thank you. Uh, so if there are no other questions on that one, I would turn it over to, I believe, Matt Smith to cover CTI. Everyone, this is actually Tyler, Tyler. Stone. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Excellent. Uh, I'll be addressing the line items here that relate to critical time intervention or CTI, as well as CMHC funding. There are three primary benefits to implementing CTI. The first is its positive impact on the health outcomes of New Hampshire citizens. CTI increases the likelihood that people transitioning out of psychiatric hospitals will reintegrate successfully back into their communities, thereby avoiding a relapse that may put them back into the hospital. Extensive academic research supports this, Randomized controlled trials, the most rigorous form of research, have found that CTI can reduce hospital readmissions uh, by as much as 26%. The program helps people leaving hospitals identify and secure the critical things they need to live independently. A job, housing, food supply, relationships with family and peers, as well as the mental and physical health care they may need. Every person CTI helps reintegrate into their community and not be readmitted to a hospital is someone once again able to be a contributing member of society. The second benefit is cost savings to the state. The average cost of an admission to New Hampshire hospital for someone under 65 is approximately $1,500 per person per day. Many individuals can stay at the hospital for weeks or even months. And as a result, the cost can quickly add up. CTI, in contrast, is far less expensive, averaging around $4,000 per person per year. Thus, while there is a recurring annual cost to pay for CTI providers, that is to say the programs and the workers around the state that would actually deliver CTI services, there is also recurring annual cost avoidance. We anticipate that every million dollars spent by the state on CTI could save 1.3 million in avoidable inpatient hospital cost. I, I, I need to I need to ask you to uh, be patient with me for a second. I, I, I got a, a couple of questions to help reorient me to, to what you're you're speaking on. Of course. Um, the first is the macro view. Uh, or is does this sequence on this matrix imply uh, recommendation priorities? Like you no. would definitely do number one, then you would definitely do number two. And if there's one that's on the cusp, it could possibly be DD redesign. Is, that, is this meant to imply priority? It is not. It is not. I would say that these are all priorities of our commissioner. And then I, I just missed it. I must have drifted off for a second there. What is at its essence, not, not the paragraph or two, but just at its essence, what is a critical time intervention? Who is doing what with the patient to make it a critical time intervention? It's an excellent question, Mr. Chairman. Critical time intervention is a program that lasts nine months, and it is a individual or sometimes a team of individuals that assist people transitioning out of psychiatric hospitals. So when they're discharged, after having had an acute mental health episode, it helps them leave the hospital and reintegrate into their community so that they have all the essential things of life to be independent back in that community on a sustainable footing, meaning finding a job, housing, access to food, uh, and, and ensuring they have access to the mental health care or physical health care they may need to stay in the community. The whole goal is to prevent readmission to a hospital, which is oftentimes a less than ideal mental health outcome and is also oftentimes very expensive to the state. So, so this is a holistic, um, intense care coordination lasting nine months after discharge to make sure that all the social determinants of health are satisfied for that patient. 
I, I think that is a fair characterization, uh, especially the emphasis on the social determinants of health at the end. Yeah, and so, so for example, if there's housing insecurity or food insecurity, uh, is, does that care coordination include finding vouchers or other programs to support that individual? That is certainly possible, yes, sir. Possible, but not present at the current time. No, what I mean by that, Mr. Chairman, is it will vary based on, on the individual. If they need assistance finding vouchers, okay. for example, then the CTI worker could help them find those vouchers. All right, I'm sorry I, uh, I interrupted you. You were on a roll. Can you get back <laughs> to where you were? Absolutely, and, and please, interruptions are welcome. The third and final benefit of CTI uh, is that it will help reduce the number of individuals on hospital wait lists by creating a more efficient model of care at hospitals. The need for such waitlist reductions, uh, I think uh, we all know is, is considerable. It's greater now, in fact, uh, than it has been really since DHHS began tracking data in 2015. Um, fewer individuals admitted to hospitals or readmitted, I should say, and instead reintegrated into their community means less pressure on the hospital system, allowing hospitals to admit and process individuals faster and more effectively. So, so I fully accept, um, I, guess, I, I, I guess where I'm going is on the savings. I wanna know more about the savings and, and that's not what you're talking about right now. But I, I understand the theory of how there's gonna be cost savings that this, that's gonna to accrue to the state. And I accept that this is good clinical care in theory. I got, I'm not de debating the program. I'm just doing the finances and, the, and, and on the savings, to what extent do you have proof or evidence or that the savings will materialize as opposed to a kind of a managerial cost estimate of theory? Our report, Mr. Chairman, goes into this in, in much greater detail. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would obviously encourage I'm just, you to- I'm just sticking my finger into this one to get some sense of how, how, how deep this is. Of course, um, I, I do think the, the report will answer that question in great detail. I would say just in the moment here briefly, uh, there's a lot of academic research that supports the idea that CTI can reduce readmissions to hospitals, including some of the most rigorous type of research, the RCTs or randomized control trials. Our analysis was predicated on using that evidence, which is extensive, to model what the reductions would look like at New Hampshire Hospital and what the attendant reduction in cost would be, assuming a reduction in readmissions. Outstanding answer. Representative Walner, did you have a question? It looked like you were reaching for your screen. No? Okay, uh, you can continue, uh, Mr. Stone. Thank you, sir. The last item I would comment on uh, in the, the document here is on CMHC funding. The primary benefit of adjusting how CMHCs or community mental health centers, of which there are 10 around New Hampshire, the primary benefit of adjusting how they're funded is cost savings to the state. CMHCs play a vital role in the state's continuum of care. They offer a range of mental health services to the citizens of New Hampshire. One such service is assertive community treatment or ACT, which provides treatment for individuals with serious mental illness in their community rather than in a hospital setting. The state currently funds this particular service in the form of annual contracts for each of the 10 CMHCs. Moving much of this cost to Medicaid, as we propose in our report, in the form of a bundled rate for these ACT services, could save the state up to $1.7 million per year. The department has the resources to develop this bundled rate and submit the appropriate documentation to the to CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services for approval. The associated one-time cost here is the anticipated cost of a third-party accounting firm to review the rate before its submission, which is a, a, a very standard practice when setting rates of this kind. Representative Walner has her hand up. Will you take a question? Certainly. So I guess a question I have on all on all of the items here. Um, 
I think it's they're really interesting um, items. And I guess my question is, how much discussion has there been with um, the providers of these services? I'm I'm asking it here, but I've also I'm also particularly interested in um, the DD system. How much uh, participation have they had in um, taking a look at these proposals? Uh, on the subject of uh, provider engagement for CTI and CMHC, I, I would have to <coughs> defer to the department representative, um, and I would have to defer to colleagues of mine to speak to DD. Thank you. Can, can we get that input at some point, uh, Chairman? Oh, sure. I'm just, uh, I'm, I, I was just about to ask Ms. Rounds if she thinks there's somebody in the participant list that might be able to address that. I was looking to see if Katya was there. She is. I don't, um, Katya, if you're available, can you raise your hand? Sometimes, sometimes staff are listening, but doing other things. So they, they may not be available. Well, I don't believe it. I believe they listen to every word. <laughs> I do. That's my job for sure. All right, I believe she's joined us. Okay. So did you um, hear the question? Oh, there you are. I did. I did. Sorry, I just had to go shut the door in um, Henry Lipman's face because um, I wanted to get the noise reduced in my office. <laughs> that was my mad rush to the door. Um, so the question, could you repeat the question, um, Representative? Um, I just want to know, I'm just wondering on all of these items, um, there's a, obviously on all of these items, there, there are providers who provide the services. How much engagement have you had with the providers? Have they had input? Um, do you plan? I mean, what, what are the plans for getting input from providers around this? That, that's a great question. So um, in particular, CTI is a program that is known to New Hampshire um, through our integrated delivery networks um, through the Medicaid transformation waiver. So that has been something that has been uh, worked on uh, by the community in your communities. Um, and we, um, so that informed um, as part, and you can see in the report, um, who was consulted, but that helped inform the um, proposal. We anticipate, so we also have um, spent a lot of time talking about how do we sustain the um, funding and the programs that are associated with ACT and with other community mental health center programming and not rely so heavily on general funds. And we've had those discussions um, off and on uh, throughout the years. Make no mistake that this includes a stakeholder process that is going to be robust. And so we're just getting our um, internal teams together, um, but we anticipate a formal engagement plan and for example, we had a meeting with the community mental health centers on Wednesday. So I briefed them on the report, made sure that they had it and had seen it and um, fielded questions. We did the same thing with the integrated delivery network uh, leads, team leads this morning. Um, so we're gonna continue to have the informal, you know, make sure you saw the report and you read through and then we're going to be formalizing a stakeholder process, working with a and and members of the team. And does that, that also includes the DD community as well, right? I would be speaking out of turn if I were to speak on behalf of that particular line of work, but I believe that that's front and center in the report as I read it, um, that there, there has to be. I mean, that we can't do these major significant changes without stakeholder input. Great, thank you, thank you. When we get to the DD item, I'll um, have Kevin bring Deb sheets over as well. Yeah. Great. I see that she just raised her hand. So I have a question for you, uh, Ms. Fox, and I appreciate you coming in uh, and answering questions. I, um, 
Okay, so I just think I sometimes think in risk management terms, and and the and the way I'm looking at this is a potential risk that I'd I'd like you to comment on, and maybe Mr. Stone, is is um, you're asking for these for basically program launch authorization. You want to go do these five programs, and you want the money now to do it. But I'm but I'm hearing in response to Representative Walner's question that uh, we haven't completed sort of the stakeholder buy-in phase of the project. And so I'm just concerned, or I'm curious rather, whether we might be launching projects that may not be exactly what the stakeholders are looking for. Could you, could you speak to that risk? And, and I'm sure it's, it's nothing, but I'd like to hear it. So I will only speak for the behavioral health projects and um, reiterate that CTI is something that has been tested through the demonstration project through the IDNs and that um, we want to scale it up. Um, and so there already has been buy-in at the community level um, and we want to scale it up and have it statewide. So um, we have ambassadors for that who are already in the community and our stakeholders. Um, that's not to say that there won't be complications as we work through the details, um, but um, we're planning to work those through. On the funding source, funding is always an issue and always at risk um, and subject to available general funds. So anytime we can um, double our money, so to speak, by um, in including Medicaid, um, including services and as a Medicaid billable service, um, has been beneficial to the system. So I'm not sure if Karen wants to give a broader perspective um, from the department, but- well, my, my question was really about the, the risk we're going to accept if we begin implementation of these programs prior to you know, fuller stakeholder uh, buy-in. And I think you addressed that, so thank you. Re uh, Representative Erf, do you, do you have a question, sir? Just a quick question for Mr. Stone. He, he said the CMHC was moving from something to Medicaid. I can't recall what the from something was. So in the recommendation, and maybe Tyler would speak to this directly, but in the recommendation is to bundle services. For example, assertive community treatment is a program that is highly intense, but it requires um, a lot of work by the teams that are at each of the community mental health centers that um, are funds that are not reimbursable by Medicaid right now. So they're activities that aren't reimbursable. So there's, um, so the idea is if you bundle a rate, you can um, include those uh, types of services um, through Medicaid, as opposed to having to tap the general funds um, for unreimbursable services. What does it mean to bundle services so they become Medicaid uh, available, so to speak. So I'm going to look to AM to give a more, um, instead of the hack job that I would do, um, to give a, a better response. I'd be I'd be happy to, to answer. Um, in 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 plain English, uh, ACT, for example, as a service, there are actually many discrete services that it comprises, and those are billed separately. Developing a bundled rate would mean there is one rate, one payment for all of those services instead of many discrete services being paid for independently. And to quickly just double back to your, your previous question, sir, um, the, the idea is to move cost from what is currently being borne by the state to having it run through Medicaid so that there are savings to the general fund of New Hampshire. I, I totally understand the, the idea and the concept. I got that completely. I, I'm just trying to understand you're su suggesting that by grouping these costs, they become Medicaid allowable, whereas independently they are not? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay, thank you. All right, you can resume if you can remember where we interrupted you. Uh, that is uh, the extent of my of my commentary. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'll, I'll turn it back over to Karen. Thank you for all your hard work on this. You've probably been working on this for quite some time. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
So the next one that we have is the SMI IMD waiver. And to answer Representative Wollner's question, uh, the, the primary stakeholder in this waiver, um, as of right now anyway, is New Hampshire Hospital. And Joe Caristi, who is the CFO over at New Hampshire Hospital, was, was involved in this finding and looking at the data and the analysis as well. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to a and to talk about the IMD waiver. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jay Nagam with uh, Alvarez and Marcel. So as Division Three has heard over the past couple of weeks, the emergency department waiting list is experiencing a resurgence after having been virtually eliminated in March of 2020. And the chair noted in the hearing on New Hampshire Hospital that at its core, this is a problem of inputs and outputs. Programs like the Philbrook Adult Transitional Housing Center are part of the solution. An additional inpatient or IMD capacity is also part of the solution. The key here is to increase throughput across the system and get people in crisis the care they need when and where they need it. So what I'd like to talk about this morning is a potential catalyst to increase throughput, which is to say expanding the state's IMD waiver from the current focus on substance use disorder to include serious mental illness as well. Now, why is a waiver required? That may be a question running through your mind. So since the beginning of the Medicaid program, the federal government has prohibited Medicaid reimbursement for inpatient behavioral care or care received in institutions for mental disease, IMDs. Over time, CMS has loosened this restriction in the face of growing needs and pressure from interest groups, most notably and recently by granting waivers of what is sometimes called the IMD exclusion rule. 31 states have received waivers for substance use disorder, SUD, including the state of New Hampshire. And most importantly for our discussion today, seven states have received waivers for serious mental illness, and one state's application for that waiver is still pending. Another logical question might be, how have we gotten by without such a waiver so far? Well, New Hampshire Hospital benefits in a major way from the disproportionate share hospital program which offsets the cost of care that would otherwise be uncompensated. Mr. Caristi shared more information about this during the New Hampshire, hearing, New Hampshire Hospital hearing earlier this month. Now, the only IMD in New Hampshire that benefits from this arrangement is New Hampshire Hospital, something which has limited the ability and interest from private sector partners in working with New Hampshire to reduce the, the emergency department waiting list. Now, what we're, what we're trying to do with this IMD waiver is to encourage a partner to develop a private IMD that would expand inpatient services, and perhaps even more importantly, to offer needed community-based services, such as mobile crisis teams or transitional housing, just like the Philbrook Center. Again, it's about inputs and outputs. Uh, basically, with Medicaid being such an important payer for behavioral health services, no private sector organization would want to risk the losses that would be incurred if Medicaid cannot reimburse stays for people aged 22 to 64, which is currently the case under the exclusion. One final crucial point to make, what would be the cost of doing nothing? Reducing the waiting list is not just benevolent policy, as important as it is to connect people in crisis with the care they need in a timely manner. There are hard dollars that cost the state to maintain people in emergency departments while they're on the waiting list. From the hearing on March 1st, we heard that there were 1,424 boarding days in the month of January, 2021. On a run rate that equates to over 17,000 boarding days per year. Now the per diem cost of boarding someone in the emergency department is estimated at $2,264 per day per diem. Now that's cited from an emergency medicine academic journal that we reference on page 13 of our report. Large portions of that fall on the general fund, whether it's through Medicaid reimbursement or through uncompensated care in the DISH program. We estimate that about half of the amount, 50%, is ultimately attributable to reimbursement. So if someone has insurance other than Medicaid, then the state is off the hook for that portion. But if the person is on Medicaid or if they're self-pay, uh, which largely ends up as uncompensated care, that does fall to the state's responsibility. The other half almost always falls on uncompensated care, which does cost the state through the DISH program. So we walked through this in detail, beginning on page 19 of the report. I don't want to take up time here reciting figures. 
um, the key takeaways, I think, are that it's actually much more complicated than those calculations anyway. There's the direct cost of boarding in terms of reimbursement on Medicaid or uncompensated care, which we just highlighted. But just as important are the risks to health and safety for other patients and emergency department staff. As the chair has noted previously, folks in mental health crisis aren't best served in emergency departments. That's not what the purpose of emergency departments is. And last but not least, this is also hardest to quantify, is the exacerbation of symptoms while people are being boarded, which could lead to longer lengths of stay in the IMD, more intensive courses of treatment, et cetera. I'm open to any questions. The chair has them or from other members of the committee. Are there questions from the committee? I, I have one if there aren't any from the committee. Okay, actually I have two. So, so as I've heard this problem over and over about emergency room boarding and the throughput issue, I, I keep imagining a graphic that looks like a pipeline that describes volume going through as throughput and then what the catch points are and how many are popping out and, and being stuck without able ability to transition to the next phase with the associated costs of those individuals that are trapped um, outside the throughput. Do you have any cool graphic like that in your report? So we do have a graphic of, of kind of the pipeline. We could attach the cost to that, but it does show, and I can actually pull it up on the screen if the uh, yeah, no, that's all right. I, you're just giving me more reason to go look at the report. I just we haven't yet because we've been really busy. So, so I appreciate you coming in and giving us, a, 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 you know, a spoon feeding on this, or at least me. Um, uh, what was my other? Oh, okay. So, uh, in parallel to this discussion, is a discussion around whether or not the state should be building a a new sixty bed. Um, forensic mental health hospital. And so there's been some questioning about, and there's been some statements on both sides of this, of whether or not that having those 60 beds, if they were assuming they were staffed, um, that that would be a nice chunk of the solution to our uh, ER boarding problem. Did, 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 did you all take a look at that component and whether or not do you have anything categorical to say about whether or not a 60 bed forensic hospital, mental health hospital would, would or would not help with the bottlenecks? So I think it would definitely help because there is a kind of one-to-one -one correlation, right? Every uh, person who is a forensic patient, which you know are, are completely on the state's uh, finances, right? There's no Medicaid reimbursement or anything available for that. Every person who is a forensic patient at New Hampshire Hospital who could be moved uh, to a new forensic facility uh, would free up a bed, right, which would, which would be filled pretty quickly, unfortunately, with a waiting list such as it is. Um, I don't have the current numbers of how many forensic patients are admitted at, at New Hampshire Hospital. I'd have to follow up with, uh, with Joe on that. Okay, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think part of your answer was, was no, you didn't specifically look at a 60 bed hospital being part of a bigger solution. That, that's correct. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't part of our report. No, um, no problem. No yeah. problem. I just, I just wanted to know because we have, like I said, a parallel conversation where we have that issue kicking around as well. Uh, so thank you. That was a great briefing. Uh, Ms. Uh, Representative Irv, do you, do you have a question? And then Representative Walner had her hand up. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick one. I missed when you talked about the savings on the IMD waiver. Yes, so we, we estimated those at approximately uh, half, a reduction of half in the waiting list. Um, there's a range of, uh, in the report, 3.3 to $4.4 million per year. Thank you. And what, what would happen with that one is the implementation is closer to sometime in fiscal year 23. So New Hampshire hospitals budget would change entirely, right? Because they would no longer receive DISH or they would receive Medicaid. And so we would have to come to fiscal committee with basically a redone budget for New Hampshire hospital. 
Well, Representative Norgren has her hand up. Uh, did, did you did you understand what Ms. Rounds just shared with us, Representative? Yes. I just had a question. Um, so one of the things that the report says is that they would have to re-engage outside group to provide those services. Uh, right now, as we know, New Hampshire Hospital um, is currently staffed by some Dartmouth Hitchcock doctors. So I was just wondering what the ramifications of that comment in the report was. I don't, I don't think it would have any ramifications as far as the services that we need at the hospital from contractors. I don't think that would change. Okay, that, there was some reference in the report, so, okay. Thank I you. think, and Jay, I'll, I'll let you jump in here, but I think that that's more referencing that there may be other providers that might come to the state and, and uh, open additional beds with this waiver in place. Yes, that, that, that's exactly the, uh, the essence, uh, Karen. It's that um, it's, it's to attract private sector operators to open a facility. I, I don't think we, uh, we, we didn't express an opinion or recommendation as to which private sector providers those might be. There, are there could be some uh, within New Hampshire, but there are certainly some from outside of the state who have expressed uh, interest to the commissioner in the past in doing so. President Norgren, your hand is still up. Do you have a follow-up? Yes, so so are we so are we talking about an out of state somebody else running this facility other than the state? So not New Hampshire Hospital. New Hampshire Hospital, there's no plans to have that run by by anyone else. This would be a provider coming in and, and opening their own beds that they operated. Now, whether it's an out-of-state provider or an in-state provider, I, I mean, it could be any of those, but think of it similar to like DRF beds. Um, you know, a provider opens those beds in the community uh, and runs and operates them in the community. Well, very well, thank you. Okay, I, I wanna do a time check. Uh, it's a couple minutes afternoon. Uh, I had been thinking that we would take a 12-15 uh, uh, break for lunch until one o'clock. Uh, so we're, we've got a couple of sh scarcities to, to manage here. One is we still have uh, another line item at least from A&M and we have Ms. Rounds, you're, you, you go away this afternoon at some point at two o'clock, I think. I do, I actually was able to extend that to 2.30, so. Okay, because I, I wanna, I don't know if you uh, had a chance to reflect on the footnote question and then the other questions that we asked uh, for you to come in today. It seemed like you had the stage on about five items today. Yes, I, I think that we'll be able to, to get to virtually all of them. Uh, Representative Walner, your hand is up. I, I just wanted to know if you are planning to go past um, 315, because if so, um, I need to... Uh, Kathy, um, Sharon, and I need to make another arrangement. So, okay, I'm sorry. That I'm, this is one of those technical answers that people hate. But <laughs> sorry. My, 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 no, it's all right. I'm because uh, you're the one that has to listen to my answer. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, at, I am not planning to go past three fifteen, but I am planning to ha hit a pretty heavy agenda that I sent out before. Uh, the, we started this morning, and I can imagine that that agenda demanding more time than we have between 1 and 3.15. And because today is such a critical day for us to try to get information, so we know what we're asking uh, of Mr. Ripple, um, I, I, I really have a strong desire to push through as long as it takes. Okay, so I guess my question is, if we have a 315 commitment, should we be now letting them know that we won't be there or? Um, how, how, how long is your commitment? Is it, would it, probably, it would probably be for one hour. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, before you guys, I think you guys should go be able to do your commitment, particularly if you don't have travel. Uh, you're doing the Zoom thing, I assume. Um, yes, yes, it's Zoom. Um, I, I think we could agree 
to have you suggest what we could continue to talk about in your absence. And it's all gonna be recorded. And if, if you wanna leave one person behind to sort of you know participate live with us, maybe that's an approach. But I, I, I'll, I'll, I try to, I'll try to give you some opportunity to do your 315 obligation. Could I ask that there be no votes during that during that? Oh, time? absolutely. That's that. Yeah, I wouldn't even consider that. Okay. Thank you. I think that clears that up for me. Thank you. Okay. So, all right. So we just used uh, four minutes of your time available, um, to, so we can end it around twelve fifteen, Mr. Nagy. Can you do that? We will certainly try. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it right over to Drew Smith. Great. Thank, thank you, Karen. And I, I'd like to thank the chairman and the other members of the committee for the opportunity to discuss our review of the developmental disabilities delivery system operated by the Bureau of Developmental Services. For the record, my name is Drew Smith with Alvarez and Marcel. In our discussion today about the funding requests for the developmental disabilities redesign, I would like to frame this discussion around two buckets. Bucket one comprises of a waiver redesign, rate development, and a modernization of IT infrastructure. Bucket two includes our recommendation related to intensive treatment services. In relation to the first bucket of items, our team conducted an in-depth review of the DD service system in New Hampshire. We concluded that under current processes, there are inadequate controls in place to manage waiver spend and to control cost. This lack of operational control has led to an inequitable system of haves and have nots in New Hampshire. These inequities are driven by three primary factors, an unfettered waiver structure, antiquated rates, and the in, in, inadequate access to data. Specifically, under current waiver operations, all participants have access to all services once they enter the system with few controls to help guide individuals to the most appropriate services based on need. Under the current reimbursement rates, which have not gone through a substantive redevelopment process since calendar year 2007, there is little historical understanding of the cost basis or assumptions used in the current rates leading to further misalignment between service costs and service reimbursement. And lastly, as provided in testimony by DLTSS earlier this week, BDS operates using outdated siloed data systems preventing its ability to more robustly manage the system and authorize and monitor services. As outlined in our report, we strongly recommend that interventions be undertaken to correct these challenges core to service management. Such investment will realign service spend with individual need much more appropriately. The goal of these recommendations is to move away from a system of haves and have nots to one where each participant gets what they need, no more and no less. This occurs through better utilization management, rates that more appropriately cover service costs, and helping align the array of services someone accesses at the initial point of enrollment. These are key to long-term system sustainability and are an important step to promoting outcomes for those with developmental disabilities in New Hampshire. The total investment to the state as outlined in the report for these three recommendations is between 800,000 to $1.2 million. However, by not making these investments, the issues outlined earlier will continue to compound and drive the likelihood of over-serving some, or more importantly, underserving others, raising risks to health and safety. Shifting to bucket two, I would like to take a moment to briefly touch on the larger financial investment DD services in our report, intensive treatment services. As noted in our report, at the time of writing, 38 individuals were being served in out-of-state long-term residential services at an average cost of $384,000 per person, peaking at just under $500,000 per person in some cases. More directly, this group accounts for less than 1% of the waiver population, but 5% of total spend. Beyond costs, importantly, is the impact on people being moved out of their local New Hampshire communities and away from family and natural supports. Driving this need for out-of-state placements is, an, is inadequacy in current reimbursement rates, as well as lacking community infrastructure to support the complexity of needs of these individuals. Our report calls for a partnership between the state and private providers to build out the physical infrastructure needs for these supports and a rate schedule that can more appropriately support these individuals in New Hampshire. While we do project potential long-term cost savings in this approach, it will require investment by the state to incentivize this shift. Depending on the level of state investment, we project the state could break even within five years. More importantly, however, is bringing people back home, 
reuniting these families and providing opportunities for individuals to re-engage in their New Hampshire communities. I hope this information helps in your review and I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer questions. I have a question. Um, I'm looking at yes, the uh, estimated one-time costs, the range between 5.9 and 6.9. And then I'm looking mm -hmm. over at the personnel costs. Oh, okay, that answered, Never mind. Uh, but, but so I'm looking at 5.9 to 6.9. How much of, that's a lot of money. So what are we investing in on a one-time basis? Sure, it's a really good question. You're, you're correct, it is a lot of money. Um, you know, what I'll say in our review of the service system is there, there's been a lack of investment to be, to be blunt in the DD infrastructure over, over a longer period of time. The majority of this investment uh, is really around the, the development of the in-state in intensive treatment services. There's an infrastructure need that, that the state needs to partner with provide, private providers to really build out. Uh, that includes yes, specialized group homes, specialized so, capacity within those homes. So I'm, I'm so sorry. I, 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 we yeah. only have just a few more minutes, and uh, I hate cutting yeah. you off. Uh, but um, okay, so when I hear infrastructure, I think things. I don't, I don't think people yes. and services. I think buildings, networks, like physical networks, pulling electricity, you know, uh, hard, hard infrastructure. Are you using the, the word the same way as I am, or are you talking about service capability by having more providers coordinating and talking with one another? Sure. No, th this is talking about physical infrastructure for the need for intensive supports for these individuals, typically dually diagnosed. There's not a capacity right now in the current group home structure within the state of New Hampshire to support these individuals uh, within the state. And so this is a infrastructure development of, of a grant program to work with providers to build physical infrastructure uh, to be able to bring people home to have a safe place for them to reside within the state of New Hampshire. So is this really truly a one-time cost or, or are we going to constantly need to be building out and maintaining those group, group homes? That's, that's a good question, right? I mean, the, the intent here is to have these be a grant program that the state invests in to help providers build the initial set. Uh, I wish I could tell you there are going to be people with complex needs coming back into your system. There will probably be a need to continuously develop this program. I can't say there have been new people that have been served in house state placement since the writing of our report. Uh, so there is a need there. And so there will be more investment. I think this initial call is to really incentivize initial development of this service in the state to get out of the uh, the practice of sending people to other states for the service and building the provider capacity. Representative Walner, you have a question? I, I do. So my understanding of this, I um, don't have a deep understanding of it for sure, but my <clears throat> understanding is that presently, I missed the number of people you said, but presently we're sending people um, to providers that provide intensive uh, services. And I think a lot of them are in, um, are, a lot of the folks are in uh, Florida. Is that my understanding? Am I correct? Correct. And yeah. how, many, how many people are we sending? So there, when we wrote this report, there were 38 individuals served in out-of-state placements, primarily in Florida, but also in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. Okay, so we are, so, I assume those those um, providers that are providing the service to our to our residents just send us a bill for them, um, or do we negotiate some sort of a, a rate with them? Uh, you know, it, it's a little bit of both, right? I mean, there is a negotiated contract, Karen. I don't know if you want to talk more more directly around the contracting agreements with the state and the private providers, but. Um, th there is negotiation that happens with out-of-state providers, just like every other state negotiates with, with similar services. Yes. Yes, Deb is also on the line. I think some of the, the struggle is the capacity and the, the number of, of types of providers across the country that are available to do this. So by building our own capacity, we build competition that, that, um, that lowers that cost. Um, I think Deb is also on the line to talk, hopefully, maybe just for a minute. I know we're at the lunchtime, but about provider engagement. 
Well, we're bringing her in. Let's at least hear Representative Earth's question in, in case she's got a, a two for opportunity. Great. Well, thank you. Just very quickly, I didn't catch the savings for the two buckets you talked that uh, Mr. Smith talked about. Sure. So, so again, we project that within five years, the break even on the initial grant investment of the uh, ITS program would be achieved. And then part of that is really dependent on the individualized rates of participants once they're in the state. So we do project ongoing savings. We've projected that at between 0. 0.7 or 700,000 to $2.3 million annually. Again, there's a lot of individualized <laughs> person centered pieces to that. Uh, similar with bucket one around the waiver redesign and rates, there's a lot of policy decisions that will drive to the impact of those numbers that we did not want to project policy in this approach. And so, yeah, we, we did not put forward a projected savings in, in that bucket. Thank you. Uh, yes. Represent uh, it's Deb Sheets, the Director of Long-Term Supports and Services. And I just wanted to uh, provide um, some additional context for uh, the question by Representative Walner. Uh, as you know, the state contracts with the 10 area agencies and the area agencies are the um, entities that provide, that do the contracting with um, the out of state uh, providers as needed for intensive treatment services. I think it's important to understand that when we started working directly with a and the first thing we did is look back before we looked forward. And in 2019, SB 86 directed the department to take a look um, through a commission study with our partners in the legislature at how we um, provide supports and services for individuals with dual diagnosis. And that report clearly indicated that we had um, not the best continuum of care and that we needed to take a look at addressing this moving forward. That was one of the first study reports that I handed over to a and and that helped provide context for the dialogue. That had um, pretty significant stakeholder engagement on the part of the area agencies, the legislature, as well as families and experts. Then in 2020, HB4 directed the department to work with the Governor's Commission on Disabilities to take a look at our system overall and opportunities for improvement. And there was a report that uh, was issued relative to that that took a look at the possibility of um, creating in-state in supports for intensive treatment services. It took a look at um, what we were considering relative to case management to autism spectrum disorder. And it also suggested that we take a look at our current waiver structure. So once again, that stakeholder input impacted the way that we began our dialogue with a and uh, In the past two weeks, the commissioner and I have met with the executive directors of the area agencies We've explained some context for the a and report. We have made a commitment to the area agencies that once they've had a chance to dig deeper into the reports that we will circle back and meet with them again. But most importantly, the recommendation from a and takes into full consideration that this is a significant system change and the ability to listen to all partners relative to this system change is step one and priority one. And so the stakeholder engagement process is the first thing out of the gate that we will be considering. I think it is very important that it's understood that this engagement includes the potential to build 10 four person group homes in cooperation with our system here in New Hampshire so that we keep our New Hampshire citizens in New Hampshire and get them the support that they need at a reasonable cost and that they are connected to their families and that we are supporting them 100%, which is what we need to do as a system here in New Hampshire. Take a question. Will you take a question, Ms. Sheets? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so uh, like three years ago, I, I was taking a look uh, on, on a committee to dealing with uh, group home parity, and there were different state uh, reimbursement rates for different group homes. And as uh, I went on site visits, I heard that a huge component of the revenue for every group home are charitable donations. And so I'm just curious if we're selecting four locations for group homes, uh, to what extent 
those group homes will, will have a sort of a naturally growing donation base that's necessary to supplement them. Okay. Have, you, have you thought about that angle? So we're always thinking about private public partnership when it comes to supporting our system. And one of the benefits of having an area agency system that does heavy lifting is that they do a considerable amount of fundraising to fill gaps. And that is something that we will always be leveraging moving forward. Okay, I, 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 I guess I've just always sensed these group homes to have grown organically in a community and then to that, that's developed the, the sort of the ecosystem of donations for each group, group home. And I, I just am curious if we're doing a top down group home location process, if, if we're gonna have that organic donation site to supplement it, but that's-, that's Again, that's, as, as Drew pointed out, these are quote unquote grant programs where we will be leveraging local resources to do the builds because in reality, it is the local resources that have the connections with the communities to determine where to put a group home, how to work with the local um, police, fire department, et cetera, to build a positive approach there. So we will be working locally. Okay, it's just if our experience with other group homes uh, carries forward, the state's not able to fully support them. And I, I hate to be building infrastructure that may not get supported fully, um, but all right. So that's, that's just a concern. Um, are there other questions from the committee? I'm not seeing any, uh, Mr. Smith, I, I, I apologize for cutting you off. I'll give you the final word. Anything you wanna tell us, we'll, we'll, we're glad to hear. No, I, I thank everybody for the opportunity today. I, I do hope that you have an opportunity to read the full report. There, there's a lot here. Our team looked across the entire DHHS system. And so there's a lot to digest, but it was a great opportunity and we thank you for your time. So let me let me ask you a parting shot. Uh, it feels yep. to me like these are five independent projects that aren't necessarily integrated. And so in theory, one could pick and choose among these five to, to, to create a unique bouquet of solutions. Or, or must we take all five if we're going to take any of them? You know, I mean, there's probably a, a quote here around the only thing that you must do in this world is pay taxes and die. But I, I mean, I think this is this isn't meant to always be a menu, right? Uh, you know, the HHS program, and I'll just speak from our experience in, in New Hampshire as well as other states. These populations are unique, and the projects that have been outlined here are unique to those populations. Um, you know, I, I don't think we want to put the state in a decision point of picking one group over the other. We pulled these programs out because we think that these recommendations are timely. We think that they will have a substantive change on the way that individuals are served within the state of New Hampshire. I don't view this as a menu. I view this as an opportunity for the state to, to really build these programs back up and, and really make this commitment to the supports that are offered to individuals within the state. It looked like you may want to have a comment there. Are these, are these integrated or are they separable? Is she frozen? Is oh, a, are you asking me? So CTI and I would say CTI, CMHC and the IMD waiver are all very integrated. They're all the mental health system. So they're, they're all very integrated. But to Drew's point, you're essentially talking about three different populations here. I, I, I heard Mr. Smith's point, I, I get it. But I, I do wanna be able to understand it from a different angle. So what three did you say were definitely integrated? CTI, CMHC funding, and the IMD waiver. All right, and don't don't take my question or comment to mean anything other than I'm just trying to understand. All right, uh, at this point, it's 12:24. Uh, I think we can uh, break for uh, lunch, and because we still have a really busy agenda, I'd like to start at one. And, and uh, my proposal is Ms. Rounds, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the first bite at the apple. You know, you got like five things we wanna talk about. And so I'll just let you start talking and knocking them out. 
I just would ask that if you if we've got something we can look at at the screen that we we have a visual to go with what you're talking about, if possible. I will do my best to do that, and I I do appreciate that. Thank you. All right. No, we just appreciate uh, your your being here and your responsiveness and and uh, and everything you're doing to help us. So so thank you. And I see that this Wanda Seller has been on the panel pretty much a lot of the time. Did, or did, did have we missed talking with her? So Wanda is, is the lead with Brendan on this project. Uh, Wanda also ran the developmental disability system in the state of South Dakota for many, many years. So she's an expert um, in that area as well. Oh, well, I'm from Nebraska, go Big Red. So, all right, um, but I don't think she has anything to say. Or does she? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I am the, the executive from Alvarez and Marcel that's overseeing this project and I appreciate the time um, that you provided um, our team to present on these really important issues. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure, and I think I do appreciate the spoon feeding. It's it's great to have experts who will just answer questions the way you have. So, so we'll see you all at one o'clock. If you could stop recording, Mr. Ripple, and put us on recess with the picture, that'd be great. Thank you. <laughs>